No, I think I'm going to be here for a while, for sure. Awesome. Well, Hard to turn down home-cooked Mexican food five days a week. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard to turn that down. I would have a problem with that as well. Well, Steve. How's it going, Driz? Oh, it's going good, man. Welcome to Liberty Radio, officially. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we're, you. We, we lit up the blowtorch, and, and we're hitting uh, all the spots across the galaxy right now. Heck yeah. I'm all for it. I love intergalactic blowtorching. Well, thanks for uh, for taking the time to, to join us. Uh, we certainly do appreciate it. Um, I, d I do have a few questions prepared, but I don't know if you've ever seen any of these interviews before. My style is, is more, I guess, uh, people describe it as conversational. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I just tend to let things uh, flow as, as they're going to and try not to get in the way too much. Yeah, I, I have a, a hopefully have a similar approach. I don't know. Sometimes people tell me I talk too much. We'll see. Uh, I'm I'm counting on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> as the interviewer, exactly. I talk too much. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. So, for folks in my audience who may not be familiar with you and your background, uh, which I imagine is probably less than half at this point, um, but they still don't know a lot about who you are. So, why don't we take just a few minutes to kind of fill in the details on that for them? Yeah, so I'm Steve Poikinen. I host a number of different shows. Uh, all of them you can find at amwakeupshow.com. Uh, I'm going into my sixth anniversary for Slow News Day uh, this weekend. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in about um, 2019... Uh, Sam Tripoli has been a friend of mine for quite a while now. Was kind enough to put me on tinfoil hat, and uh, I got to get to know a few people that way. And it's been a grind ever since, man. It really has. But prior to that, I didn't have a you know, primarily a carpenter uh, and you know remodel construction, all that kind of stuff. I done some writing here and there. Um, was blackballed by decent, respectable publications in 2008 uh, for writing an article called Barack Obama, Reagan with a Tan, that uh, got me in a ton of trouble. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I put aside the writing thing for, you know, wow, well, a decade. And then, you know, 2018, there was just such a wide lane in independent media for people who weren't doing partisan content you know like everybody had a, a political axe to grind and a team they were cheerleading for um and that lane is still almost exactly as wide as it was six years ago yeah by the way yeah, yeah. i would agree <laughs> it's amazing yeah there's a lot uh, of hackery going on not a, not yeah. a lot of independence from what i can tell no, it, it's, I mean, it really is few and far between. So uh, I really do appreciate people like you who don't take uh, a hacky angle for it. There's no clickbaity title nonsense. There's, you know, it's just it, well, it's straightforward. Yeah. 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 As clickbaity as I'll ever get is trying to do like the weirdest possible thumbnails that I can pour out of my head on any given day. I always like playing with words myself. My yeah. my uh, thumbnail game is nowhere near the level of yours at the moment. Uh, I I hope to get to that level one day, and I would like to think that I'm I'm working my way there. Uh, Heck yeah, yeah. That's right. You know, I didn't know how to do any of that crap until like two years ago, and then it became evident that I was going to have to produce them for AM Wake Up, and I didn't want to have a fiverr account with somebody in bangladesh to do you know the exact same thumbnails that everybody else did so i got knockoff photoshop called pixlr that i just started fucking around yeah i've used pixlr before it's it's interesting because as I've, I've as i've gone through my journey in independent media which 
hasn't been quite as long, about half as long as yours at this point. Um, I, I see people using tools that I've been familiar with previously from, you know, working in electronic sales and, and all of that sort of thing. And I find it very interesting how people have adapted different tools, you know, to perform a, a certain function uh, in their in their re in their media repertoire, which is something I wouldn't even have thought of when I first encountered that application, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Yeah, I did. people are going nuts with Canva and I don't that's something I'm not necessarily familiar with, but I also don't edit videos. Uh, I just I haven't been able to dedicate the amount of time to teach myself that skill. Uh, and so, you know, it's just just thumbnails and word, man. I don't know. Talking that works so far, kind of mostly uh, that's because we have a fantastic audience and producer base. And, uh, you know, every month is uh, a is scary <laughs> but we get through somehow so i i do I get massive amounts of appreciation for the people who help power the show oh absolutely i mean well especially with the you know following the value for value model without those folks there as you always say there is no show like they are actually the fuel that makes the engine run Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that, that's solely because, you know, independent media or, you know, uh, new narrative network, mainstream alternative media, whatever you want to call it, is the opposite side of the legacy media coin. They have the exact same funding mechanisms. In a lot of cases, there's overlap with, you know, people on boards of companies that are on boards of companies that are, uh, you know, funding the the mainstream alternative and um yeah it's disgusting to me i don't want to be any part of that and so we don't paywall any of the content we're never going to there's never going to be like ad breaks or ad reads that we do you know i understand that when you click on rumble now there's like 75 ads to play but uh we we don't see that you know and uh it's you know we can get right into each and every show there's no like 10 minutes of promo code this sponsor that ad reads um and just yeah you put it out there you leave it up to people to decide if they see value in it and if they do they they do and it works you know i'm not gonna buy an island anytime soon but i hear you have to have a whole bunch of bottles of ghb if you're gonna do that anyway and i just don't i don't i'm not gonna So when you were getting started uh, in producing media, like we can we can say like 2008 was whatever it was, right? When when mm -hmm. you decided to get serious, did you have somebody that you were able to uh, to look to for instruction and guidance, or were you more just kind of flying by the seat of your pants, figuring it out as you went? Yeah, no, I just jumped in head first and um, I didn't really, I didn't really know anybody in, in this space, you know? I, okay, so the two people that I did know were Ron Placone and Sam Tripoli. And both of them were, were highly encouraging, um, but definitely not like, you know, uh, here's how you do this or this is a broadcasting technique that you could utilize, uh, it, none of that. So everything that has kind of, you know, fallen out or developed from that has been by either sheer dent of will or complete stupidity or everything in between. Um, and, and yeah, like, I mean, I do, I give, I give Sam a lot of credit for me still having a show because he really, you know, he's been in my corner for fuck dude years now. And um, Ron Placone was my first guest twice. I had a version of the show that I did in May of 2018 with my buddy Redneck Josh from Minnesota, and he froze up and just sucked so bad that uh, he immediately quit. And he was like, I can't do this. I'm sorry. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be saying, even though I have things in my head that I want to say. 
you know, and I wanted to put that show on a flash drive and just wear it as a talisman to warn off future failures. I, I, I didn't do that, uh, but I wanted to. Uh, and the, yeah, so I mean, like, but and both of the you know episode zero shows that I shot, um, uh, Ron was the guest the first. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, there's a lot that's happened between now and then. Uh, but uh, but I will always be grateful to Lil Ronnie Placone for you know just sticking in there like that. Um, and yeah, man, I did. It's. <sighs> I knew I knew what I didn't want to do, uh, and that helped kind of determine what you know I would be doing and what the course of the show would take. But I just I I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy talking to people who aren't connected to any of that mainstream nonsense. You know, every once in a while we'll get somebody on the show who did eh, halfway in, halfway out, something like that. Um, but for the most part, you know, I've been able to be really fortunate over the last six years to have conversations with people that I never would have thought I would be on a, a video call with, you know, and, and yeah, it's like, it's been for example, crazy. John McAfee. Yeah, that was nuts. That was freaking nuts. And that was, you know, I did next Cinco de Mayo. That will have been five years. Wow. Yeah, it did four and a half years since I had that conversation, uh, basically. And dude, I still think about it like a lot. You know, I haven't really gone back and rewatched it too much, but um, yeah, it was crazy, absolutely crazy. But also, like Cynthia McKinney, I've had a couple of really great conversations, and she was the last person I ever voted for, um, which I knew wasn't going to do anything, but I wanted to, you know, go ahead and participate in the ritual just so i could check the box for her name uh and yeah dude it's it's been it's been crazy it really has the accelerationism the way that they just stomp down on the gas for the world to you know check off the agenda 21 boxes and then get ready to build the infrastructure for 2030 and all of the madness that we're subjected to it's been i don't know how people can walk around like bored or depressed this shit's wild because they're they're living in in a fantasy world that's that's why they they don't actually see the things that are going on that people like you and i see they live in a completely different reality i i became convinced of that when covid happened you know, because I lived in a neighborhood where at the very beginning of it, back in March, back in April, noontime comes around and you would hear people banging their fucking pots and pans. You know, yeah. it was ridiculous. They did this howling thing in the Santa Cruz Mountains where at like 7 or 8 p.m. they'd walk outside and they would, Burr! I'm not, I'm not making that up. It was real. And you could kind of, yeah, I lived at the time up on a little ridge and uh so everything everybody that was down below that was out there ba effectively banging pots and pans but doing the howl thing you would hear it start to like you know waft up the hill and it just shake my head like these freaking clowns dude they got you out there barking like a seal yeah yeah yeah, dude, yeah. i had i had people uh say nasty things to me in the supermarket because i because i wouldn't wear a mask Mm -hmm. um, just all sorts. I, I got fired from my job. Well, first I got laid off, right? And then when I got brought back and I wouldn't wear a mask, I got fired. Because uh, there was nothing under Virginia state law that said that they could put that kind of requirement on me. Yeah. And they knew I was right, but they still fired me anyway. But yeah, it was, yeah. It was insane. I felt pretty lucky during that because I was doing, you know, construction and remodels and uh, we had a number of clients that even if they were halfway compliant they, with, you know, some of the protocol stuff, they were mostly just, you know, older cantankerous mountain folk who didn't want to hear any of the nonsense and we could show up and like the only, you know, 
the only times I really ever wore a mask at work is if we were doing like drywall or there was a right. whole bunch of concrete going on or is this something that you would naturally, <sighs> you know, on the job site wear a mask for anyway. Dude, I was working at a paint store, uh, a Benjamin Moore retailer in McLean, Virginia in All March right. of 2020. When the when the the Langley housewives started coming in and buying up all the drywall masks, like it started serious tension in the store because the drywall dudes were coming in and they were like, "Where the fuck are our masks? We got work to do." Yeah, yeah, no, the you know lady down the street already got all four boxes of them. That's so silly. It really is, and I don't know what they were. I don't know. It, it, the drywall masks don't even keep the drywall out. No. I don't know what the fuck they thought they were going to do as far as, you know, an imaginary virus, whatever. I don't know. What, what's your, what, so what, what's your theory about the Rona? What do you think it was? I think it was, without a doubt, uh, the greatest psychological operation that has ever uh, been foisted upon mankind. All right. Bar none. Bar none. Because here's the thing, and I kept I kept trying to make this point to people the whole way. There doesn't ever need to be a virus. All they needed was for a significant portion of the population, and that's not even a majority. All they needed was a significant portion to believe that there mm-hmm. was a virus, because then those people would act as if. And they would they would essentially be a, a force on the rest of the people. So I yeah, and yes, and I uh, Denis Rancor, who it was the first person I ever saw say uh, pandemic of the PCR test. Yeah, um, early on in, in 2020. Well, I mean, that's uh, really where it all falls apart, isn't it? Yeah. Because it, yeah. PCR is, is not a diagnostic tool. It's an amplification tool. Well, and it's, I mean, yeah, we, we all know this now, but it, there weren't a ton of people uh, unless you had, you know, listened specifically to Kerry Mullis before he was uh, unalived. Um, yeah, not a lot of people knew that you could just set it for whatever cycle you wanted to get whatever answer you wanted from it. And it's the if you wanted to manipulate a population, that's the only available assay that they had at the time to do that. Um, and they did. They did. I, I do. I do kind of think that there was something bio weapony that that people were you know, given at the uh, military Olympics mm-hmm. about a month before they started talking about having cases and you know, things like that, because, you know, my, my family got laid out right after Thanksgiving for like three weeks, never been that Hmm. sick. Uh, the San Jose airport was close by. There were a bunch of, you know, that was one of the places that they had, uh, at least stated was like, a, a entry point for people with the Rona. Um, it definitely felt different to me than just a, a standard colder flu. Um, but I never, you know, I mean, we never took a test for anything right. because I didn't want anybody shoving a Q-tip up my freaking nose. That didn't sound like any fun. Um, standard ways that you would get yourself better, you know, that kill it with food and vitamin C and stuff like that. Don't be afraid of the sunshine. You know, they're, they're keep the mineral count in your body reasonable and up, that sort of thing. Right. And, and we got, you know, got through it. Um, never got sick like that again. But there was definitely, you know, say it was something different. And then that was the justification for the mRNA treatments, uh, which I think are a force amplifier for whatever underlying illness you may have. And that's why there's people who drop from myocarditis. That's why people are getting the accelerated turbo cancer. Uh, the introduction uh, of the mRNA jabs is what's it's the catalyst for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know. Um, but I, I really doubt we'll ever see any sort of recompense for it. 
I don't I don't think that's how it works, but I do think the people's ability to understand uh, has increased quite a bit over the last couple of years. And, and that does, you know, that's a, I don't know if you want to call it a white pill or whatever, but um, it's encouraging. It's encouraging. Hmm. Well, I mean, we're, we're a resilient species, right? Like think, think of just what we have been subjected to over the course of the last 125 years. Right. Since industrialization has really gotten into full swing, like all the pollutants, all the toxins, all all the vaccines, like all of the the poison that has been injected into our society over that time. And yet we're still here, you know, many of us thriving under such conditions. I think it really is a testament to just the the human will and the ability of the human being as an organism to adapt to its environment yeah which is also uh, uh a little bit disconcerting given everything that's being pumped into the environment mm -hmm. you know but yeah i mean we there there's an amazing resiliency to human beings that i uh, the only reason we're still around yeah, and you know, Lord knows, tried to kill each other enough over the years. Various different, yeah, you know, whether that's direct war or it's you know the poisoning of the water supply or the ground or the skies, and yeah, we keep we it's it's us and roaches all the way down, right? And now they're trying to get you to drink the roach milk. Yeah, uh, maybe that's why. Maybe it's because we're going to be the only things left. So we might as well get used to it now. Right? Yeah. Never know. I'll pass on that. I will. I don't need any of that. So don't. what was it that, that made you get into this industry? Like what made you decide to make that jump? Um, well, I, I'm basically unemployable in the wild. Uh, you know, I mean, I've got the, the like I said, I was an under the table carpenter for you know decades, uh, and very fortunate to have like, if not totally like minded employers, then employers that were like, well, as long as this isn't the you know tenor of the conversation that we're having every day, and you can shut up and work, then we're fine, you know. But um, when I went uh, full time, because I, I you know basically fucked from life. Uh, or, or from my, the beginning of my formative years, teenage years, stuff like that, I got handed some very, very good LSD way too young and, um, then got handed a copy of behold a pale horse when I was like 14 or 15, uh, always listened to art bell show and stuff like that throughout junior high and high school. Um, so I never, you know, never really put both feet into quote unquote society. I did Renaissance festivals for a number of years, uh, where you're, you know, traveling every two months and, uh, living in a, uh, you know, trailer RV, something like that, living behind the booth. Um, if you were lucky, you know, your booth had a bedroom built off of it and that's where, that's where you were. Uh, and so I never, you know, never really jumped in. Uh, and I'd been doing Slow News Day for, I don't know, close to four years. Um, yeah, three years at that point. Um, <clears throat> and my boss got injured. And so um, <clears throat> it was it just, it was an opportunity to go ahead and leap into the show full time. So I did. Uh, and that was, yeah, I think april of 2021 so it's been about what two and a half years a little bit more than two and a half years uh that i've been doing just the show as the vehicle to pay bills and it's somehow somehow getting you know getting there every month um and again that's just all all credit to the producers for that um but i I truly, truly believe that what we're forced to react to doesn't have to be this way. 
I truly believe that if we want to get out of this, then it's up to us to create the kind of culture we want to live in as opposed to the culture that we're forced to react to. And I've seen a lot of proof of concept in that uh, over the last couple of years, especially now that we're like rolling full steam on third eye carnivals. I think that that's a, a vehicle for the kind of culture creation that, you know, I would prefer to live in and be mm -hmm. a part of. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, it, I guess that's borderline activism, but I'm not not a hundred percent on that. <clears throat> I just know that it doesn't have to be this way, and I would rather you know take all the people that I love along with me while we do this rather than have to watch them, you know, be subjected to bloodline death cult insanity. Uh, it sounds like a good philosophy to live by, if you ask me. So I hope so. What was your big takeaway from Third Eye Carnival this year? Because I didn't, we didn't really get a whole lot of time to interact while that was going on. Because you're busy as fuck. You were all over yeah. the place all the time. It was, it was, it was actually something to behold. <laughs> it was a lot of work, man. It was. So the the takeaway that I had from it is that we it can it can work. The, that we can do this we can do you can get that many people in a room in pueblo you know then you can get that many or more people in a room in just about any other city uh, in the country um and the the conversations that i was having with people who were just over the freaking moon about being able to interact with other people that they knew, you know, thought the same or similarly about some of the more key issues that we're facing the necessity for that, uh, that, that struck me because it was every conversation that I had, you know, was, we really need to be doing this really needs to happen. I'm, you know, uh, Tease and I were talking when we first started pitching the concept before it was even a third eye carnival we came to the realization almost immediately that if we didn't go ahead and do the thing nobody else was going to volunteer to do it on their own so we we had to you know the, the throw ourselves out there try to create something that people were going to enjoy and then deliver on it uh, and i think for the most part that happened um so it, it allowed me to understand that you can do this kind of stuff. You can give it to people at a price they can afford. Um, and it doesn't have to like break all of the performers. It doesn't have to, you know, break the bank of the people that are attending. And, uh, and people really, really, really want to get together in three dimensions and meet each other, hang out, party, talk about this stuff and connect on a level that you know you just never get to in the digital space right it's it's interesting you you talk about being able to uh provide you know essentially entertainment for folks at a reasonable price um i don't know if you were tuned into uh, media monarchy this morning or not but uh james was uh going over a, a story where they were discussing um venue prices as far as like uh, tickets for the end user today you know against like when the beatles sold out shea stadium you mm -hmm. know uh and they were saying that that what people paid for a ticket back then to get into that show today would have been you know about 40 45 dollars something in that price range and you look at you know, the, the tours that are out there, the shows that, that folks have available to go to, none of them are anywhere near that. No, it's crazy what they're getting away with charging right now. And it's crazy what people are willing to pay. Dude, they, when I was in Vegas, Tenacious D tickets were like $700. What? Yeah. To go see it was two a, a, fat old men jump around on stage? Yeah, it was a New Year's Eve thing or something like that. Sugar went. Her her dude bought her dude at the time bought her a ticket for it. Um, but I mean, you know, the festivals and stuff like that. I I've done as uh, you know, just a, a fan 
uh, you know, used to go to a ton of festivals. And that was when it was still reasonable ish, you know, between 75 and 150 bucks or something like that for, you know, two, three days of music, camping, that kind of thing. But reasonable. Right. It's still money, but, you know, it wasn't, you didn't have to save up six months just to get tickets to one thing, you know, and go out one time. And that whole business model has gone through the freaking roof. I can't yeah. stand it. I used to <clears throat> used to go to the Strawberry Music Festival, which was a, a huge, like, I don't know, bluegrass Americana type thing. Um, uh, you know, with a whole bunch of different artists, but, but they focused more heavily on that. And uh, I was like load in, load out crew for that. You know, and when that was one of the only paying jobs that they had at the festival, everything else was volunteer. Um, but once the Yosemite Rim fire happened and Hetch Hetchy burned down, the, the site for the event burned down, and they moved it over to Grass Valley, they like skyrocketed the ticket price for it. And it made me not even want to go, you know, volunteer, do load in, load out because it was just such a blatant money grab. The talent went, talent pool went down, ticket prices went up. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, so from the standpoint of somebody who wants to do a lot of the third eye carnivals and stuff like that, I have a really good idea of what I don't want to do and how I don't want to do it. And a really good idea of what I'm trying to get out consistently and that's the the Hank three model, where if you know that your audience is blue collar, if you know that your audience is like working poor or whatever, then you can't for any reason think that you can get away with gouging anybody on. It. Right. So it's going to stay like that, you know, for as long as possible, for as, le you know, as little as we can get away with charging and still pay for the venue and, you know, pay the bands and stuff like that. Well, I think it's a, um, I've kind of always seen it as, as a trade-off because it, it's, it's an issue that I've encountered when I was in sales, right? Throughout the course of my life, because there, there's always two ways you can go with anything. You can, you can cater to a specific niche market, right? And, and the reason that you're catering to that specific market is because you know uh, that there is value that you're going to be able to pull out of it, right? You know, these yeah. people have money to afford the product that you're selling, in other words. Um, the other end of that is to be able to reach as wide an audience as possible, you know, in, instead of getting high ticket from very few people, you're getting low ticket from a lot of people. And either way you go, you're going to end up at about the same destination. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 No, that's the, and I, I, I basically like, and we talk about this from time to time on the show. Um, but basically what the, the carnival is, is giving people permission to live their best and freest life. And people need that. Like that's one thing that I've definitely discovered over the last, you know, six years of doing this people are waiting for somebody to give them permission to learn about these things, to talk about these things, to get together with other people and talk about these things. And I, I definitely, um, like it's hard for me to wrap my head around because I was always one of those like easier to ask forgiveness than permission kind of thing. Um, but, but, but that's the reality. And so if that's going to be the reality and somebody's got to, you know, step up and then offer up permission, then let's do it in a way that we can reach not just the, not even the most people, but the people who most need it, you know? Uh, and so that's why I'm always looking for, um, you know, it, constantly talking to people about different venue locations and stuff like that, different areas of the country where we can all get together, make it less of a travel burden for the people who did have to travel was absolutely floored by how many people came from, you know, different corners of the country to be there. You know, we, we even had a Canadian pop in on us hmm. um, who like woke up on a Wednesday morning before the carnival and was like, yeah, I'm going to go. It was, grabbed a ticket and 
popped up, you know, people from Atlanta and Florida and, um, we had, you know, Yona came out from West Virginia and we had yeah. people from upstate New York and all that kind of shit, dude. It was, I mean, it was great. So it was one of those, you know, actual, if you build it, they will come sort of realizations. Um, uh, and yeah, as if those can pop off over the course of the next few years in like 30 or 40 different cities, man, we'll definitely be, you know, taking part in, in creating the culture that we want to live in. And I kind of think that's basically incumbent on people that are in this space, you know, that are doing it to try to get out the kind of information that shifts consciousness, I guess. I don't know, man. That sounds a little grandiose and I don't mean it to come off that way, but I, you know, we're, we we get on camera and we talk this shit all day every day uh, and it's not just to hear the sound of our own voices and it's not to collect a check that's for sure uh you know so i mean i guess if you're going to talk about it you have to be about it well the way i see it with the system that we were born into uh we were never given a choice about you know, whether or not we were going to be indoctrinated, it just happened. So I always see that it's basically the duty of those of us who managed to extract ourselves from that system uh, to, you know, to whatever degree we're able to do it, you know, provide the knowledge of our experience as, as we go along the journey so that other folks can have it as an example. Because, I mean, it, I don't, like you mentioned, you mentioned Art Bell, right? I, I grew up listening to Coast to Coast AM, too. Uh, you mentioned Behold a Pale Horse from Bill Cooper. I found that when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Um, so, I mean, it. other folks have, have walked this path before, and they have left behind artifacts of their journey. The way I see it, we're just basically doing the same thing. And if, if that helps to, to shift, you know, the, the greater consciousness of the masses, cool. Because maybe we need something like that to happen right now. I mean, it's happening whether or not we're, we're taking part in it. But uh, the, it's a, you know, fairly apocalyptic moment. Uh, and, you know, uh, apocalyptic in the truest form of what that word means um yeah no it, there you know you can either wait for life to steamroll you or you can get out in front of it and go do something about it uh, and there's a you know sort of a i don't know if it's like gen x mentality or whatever but I mean, we kind of knew fairly early that we were screwed that nobody was coming to save us and that if we didn't, you know, if we didn't get out and do something for ourselves, we were just going to be caught up in whatever current came our way. Um, and so there, you know, the, there's uh, like basically the last generation, in my opinion, who had any sort of, you know, pioneering spirit or anything like that. Uh, and I think that with the rise of AI and people, raising you know giving freaking infants and toddlers a screen to go stare at uh i think that most of that you know uh, go make your own way kind of spirit has been eliminated and so it's kind of down to us to to you know try to do something about it while we still can before the complete you know before the digital prison grid slams its doors on us for good yeah yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't. And I, and I mean, no, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I'm say there's just giants and legends that you know, like people like Milton, Bill Cooper, uh, and be, I, Jordan Maxwell is just a fascinating individual to me. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with everything he said, but very, very, very studious and very good at communicating. Um, and you know, there's just absolute legends that, 
uh, you, even today or still, you know, like I love David Icke. I really do. I don't agree with everything that he says. I think he might be a, a crypto theosophist. I think he might be, but he's done There's more an to wake you can make. He he's done more to educate and wake people up than just about any living person that I can think of right now. Uh, uh, and I, he's done some incredible work and his basic points about a lot of things still hold up 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah. David Icke is, uh, another one that I got into in back in the nineties mm -hmm. and nineties into the 2000s. Hell Alice in Wonderland and the world trade center is probably one of my favorite books of all time. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It, and it covered a lot of it covered most of the anomalies of 9-11 whether or not he got every little detail right i can't say but as far as the overall picture goes it, it was one of the better ones that i read well and i mean with something like that where where you're never ever ever we're never going to know the exact story the, most of these huge psyop events, we're never going to have every detail laid out and proven to us. It should be enough to know that you're being lied to. It should be enough to know that your government hates you enough to do something at this scale to its own people. Same with COVID. You know, we don't necessarily have to have every but complete detail down to know that we got sold a, a complete bill of goods that didn't amount to anything other than loss of liberty. Uh, and that should be enough to galvanize uh, a population. It's not, you know, I, I think that's obvious, but it should be. And so it, with all of these events, it's not even about, you know, who's got the best take on it or who's got this information or that information, just the knowledge that, you know, you were lied to your government engaged in a direct psychological warfare campaign against you, that that should be enough. And I think where a lot of the independent media gets, um, I don't know, hard to deal with. It is everybody trying to take victory laps when they don't know and then getting malicious in the process it, it, against people who are out there doing the exact same thing, but because it's that traditional media model where the only thing that matters is the clicks and the sponsorships, it becomes more of a blood sport than it does trying to actually get correct information or uh, you know assess a, a particular event in the best way that you know possible and it's down to sensationalism and buffoonery and i hate that crap this is why i didn't like mainstream media and it's becoming an exact mirror image of it well i think that was uh, by design you know completely because the the, they want to shift people away from television, away from radio, away from newspapers, away from the traditional forms of media because they're not as effective as digital media is at programming people into the boxes, into the roles that they're supposed to assume in society, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was poking in on the the rumble chat too, and it, yeah, Bill Cooper had some some shit to talk about Jordan Maxwell back in the day. I think he talked shit not, about just about everybody. Just about everybody, yeah. Hard guy to please, Bill Cooper. That's Hard right. guy to please. I, <laughs> I would like to think he would have listened to Liberty Radio, but I'm probably just lying to myself. Right. Well, hey, look, we you know. I, I would like to think that that he would have cruised by AM Wake Up once or twice and not been completely horrified, but you know, you you, you never can tell. I understand that I am frequently unkempt, you know, uh, and that I sound like I may have smoked a joint or two in my life, um, and that really did. It amazes me how many people that just turns off if you're not there in a suit with a uh, you know three hundred dollar haircut telling people sweet little lies that they don't want to listen to anything and they'll discount everything based solely on 
you know, something like your appearance. It's pretty wild. I try not to do that shit. Yeah. Maybe I do. I don't know. So, I don't think so. So do do you deliberately um not try to to make the the presentation you know uh appealing to the eye i guess we'll say like is that is that something that you just don't focus on at all you're like all right i got i got a camera i got a microphone everything seems to be working let's go yeah i mean that's basically it but that's you know i didn't have any i did i used to do the show at my friend's recording studio and even then we were just on a couch with a couple of you know the tabletop mics um I mean, with the technology that we have available to us, especially if you run um, clips or you're going to pull up an article and go through it with the audience, you, in my in my opinion, you don't need a freaking fifty thousand dollars studio to do that. You don't need a lucite desk. You don't need a hair and makeup team. You don't even it, really need to be on camera. No, you really don't. And, and so, it, you know, I naively probably think that the the content itself is what should count not necessarily how you know expensive the the host is <laughs> or not you know not necessarily how expensive the broom they're sitting in is but that does make a difference to a lot of people um uh, and i mean you know we we did we tried it that way we had the studio in vegas um which was, you know, a room in a, uh, two rooms in an office building that we were renting. And, you know, as often as possible, had somebody who was producing the show. And we had a nice desk and a couple of little LED lights behind us and a couple of fake plants. And, and I mean, it was cool. I enjoyed that. But um, I don't think it's a necessity. You know, I'm about to change around the setup here over the weekend, and it'll probably look a little bit cleaner. But th there's only so much that I'm working with in general. And uh, and again, man, I've just you know, I've always been a freaking laborer. You know what I mean? I'm not a fancy individual. That's not gonna happen. You know, it's I like tried wearing a freaking uh, suit jacket. Just to see what would happen. It didn't change anything. It didn't. Like very early on when I was doing the Assange vigils and stuff like that. We had, we had enough people complain about the general appearance of both me and Andrew that we were like, okay, we'll try. We'll try. So, you know, I pulled my hair back and freaking put a jacket. It didn't do anything. Could, couldn't they at least wear like a polo or something? <laughs> right? No. You know, and now that you know, I've had the the relationship with Big Frog, uh, who really does make the best freaking shirts on the planet. Fuck yeah, they do. Why would I want to go put on a, a button down when I can rock one of Ryan's shirts? You know, I do. I will say this, man. I have a like a fetish for Western wear shirts. I really like those, but it just hasn't. You know, it's f too freaking hot eight months out of the year to even try uh so as the weather starts to change I'll, I'll probably be throwing a couple of more of those on but i'll still have the am wake up shirts on under it because again they're killer and i ryan if you're listening i need my weimart shirt I don't i don't have one of those yet i do we're we're in full weimart time uh, it's it's wild de-dollarization is a real thing oh yeah Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all fake currency anyway. Yeah. It's all heavily manipulated anyway. But the it really does look like the squeeze is on to de-dollarize the rest of the world. And then, uh, you know, maybe have a few NATO countries that are still trading in it. But whatever currency BRICS is coming up with, I think is going to become the more dominant currency over the next, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 years. It's possible. I still think they need the dollar as the uh, as the foil to whatever the BRICS currency is going to be. Apparently, they still don't even really fully know yet. They're like, oh, yeah. well, it's going to be backed by gold, but there's also there's going to be these baskets of commodities, and we're just kind of kind of make it work however we need to. But I well, mean, the they're going to have a cross border payment system, so it's it's basically moot. 
doesn't matter yeah. what your currency is. Well, and the cross-border payment processors are all going to balance out in CBDC uh, right. of one form or another. Right. Swift came out and said that last year that they would have their uh, central bank digital currency infrastructure in place at 2025 at the latest uh, and that they were on track to do it by the end of this year. So that's, I mean, that's happening regardless. And then BRICS is doing something similar ish, but yeah, the, the, they haven't necessarily decided on one particular form or another. And they can say that kind of stuff, at least in terms of commodities and resources, because those are the countries that have them. Right. The UK can't be out, can't come out and be like, Oh, we're going to do gold now because the the only gold they have they've stolen from people it's not like you can just go mine it you know so it, the resource rich countries are going to be in a much better negotiating position going forward especially as the u.s military proves itself to be incompetent and you know what woefully inadequate once you actually drop them down to fight somewhere that's not to, you know, the throw shade at any of the veterans listening or anything like that. But everybody that I've talked to over the last several years that has been in the military has said that you know, standards wise, it's just plummeted over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and that you, they're just, you know, um, when they lowered standards for recruiting for the surge, the Iraq surge, and they started taking you know, more, uh, potential felons, right. <laughs> more, you know, less, the, the less sharp people. And then also the queering of West point hmm. that's gone on over the last 15 or 20 years. I was reading an article the other day where they were basically saying that West point has devolved into effectively a liberal arts college. Uh, and so, and I don't, I don't know how true that is or not. I really don't. Um, but, having talked to a uh, uh, former major Danny Sherson a number of times, like what he was teaching at West Point was almost the exact same versions of history that they're teaching at Harvard or Yale or Smith or Brown. Uh, and so it is, yeah. you can kind of see some overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. And over time it would have, the ideologies would have seeped in and would have began, you know, corrupting the structure and all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it all makes sense, especially when you when you look at things on on the geopolitical playing board. Right. Because you have for mm -hmm. the last 20, 25, 30 years, China has been making deals with all these resource rich countries in order to to bring about this um uh economic alliance that that apparently they're going to call bricks or maybe they'll change the name at some point in the future and rebrand it to something else who knows but that's what it is right now and then over the course of that time is when we've had the degradation of the the military force as well as getting mired into wars of conquest even though that was actually happening before as well, but it was after the institutional rot had really set in in the federal system. I mean, it, none, of, none of what's happening in the world today, looking at it from a historical geopolitical standpoint, none of it is surprising. Like it, everything that has happened from the beginning of the 20th century up till now has led us up to this point. Like, there's a very clear line that can be drawn there. But like you were saying earlier, most people just don't recognize that at all. Because they don't, they don't take the time, they don't, take, they, they don't put forth the effort to actually learn on their own and then internalize what they learn. Is there a way to trick people out of the cave. And maybe trick is not even the right word, right? 
Well, I think your mic went out again. How about now? Gotcha. Okay. God damn, that's a bummer. Um, yeah, may I mean, okay, so the I guess when you get up, at the the problem with the cave, and this is what Howdy McCoskey was talking about the last time that he was on the show, is that the way that it currently works is you've got people that get up turn around from the wall and then just go to a different part of the cave and make fun of the people that are still staring at the wall. Right. Talk shit about people that are still staring at the wall. Uh, and so, and then I guess even getting outside of it, it it's not the end all be all, you know? It, so if you're going to convince uh, 60 120 million people to do something that is in their own interest as opposed to you know, against their own best interest, which is what voting is and all this other crap that, you know, uh, then you do kind of have to have as good a, an ad campaign uh, as they do. Uh, it's because people are grossly comfortable with being this screwed over each and every day. Like people are just beat down and used to it. And the significant portion of people that have recognized that they're being lied to are aware of about 50% of that. Right. And, and where 50% of the lies are coming from. And I know they change grading standards, but when I was growing up, if you got 50% on something, you failed. You, you, that was not a passing grade. So even if you're half right, you're still half wrong. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that I'm, you know, all, all the way correct on things. I'm not. Um, but I've at least figured out where what a number of the, the biggest grifts are. Uh, and so that does give you, I don't know, it's. That we talk about the belt classes and stuff like that on the show. The AM wake up is, you know, that probably scares people away because we're having advanced belt class conversations to people who are, that still think redacted is a good show. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, I guess it's about being, being humble enough to recognize that you're not going to be able to speak to the requisite number of people that you would need to get some serious system overhaul on your own. And, and so networking with people at various stages or that do, you know, various different belt classes with, when they do their show, I think that's part of it. And we've got to, we, we've got to figure out ways to, bring everybody along at the advancement levels that they're maybe a little uncomfortable with, but you know, enough to keep them enough comfortability to keep them coming back. And so, I mean, that is why I like the, the concept of the independent media Alliance and stuff like that, because everybody involved in that is talking to different people every day. Like it's a, mm -hmm. you know, audience overlap, but it's not as much as, uh, even I thought it did, you know, uh, the uh, very wide ranging audiences of people that are involved in it. So something like that, I think if we can network with enough people who are themselves talking to enough different people, then that has the, the Ricky Verandas ripple effect that we're going for. Hmm. So beyond, beyond the conversations that, that you and I have had about the independent media alliance, because I don't think we need to rehash any of that here. Um, I'm more interested to find out what feedback you've been getting from other people about it. It's 90% uh, stoked, 10% hater. Hmm. Um, uh, that and actually sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, I, you know, obviously I don't mind that people are skeptical and I'm happy to have, you know, like we did an individual conversation. Um, and people should be, you know, they should be 
question, you know, they should be questioning all this stuff. They should be. Um, but I, when you make uh, guaranteeing the content is going to stay free, when you've not attached a single, you know, funding mechanism to the project, I, I think that does help establish a little bit more integrity with it. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, we're going to start doing over the next couple of months um, live debates like with each other because we don't all agree on the same stuff. Uh, everybody comes from a, a very, very different background. So, I mean, the, you know, individual differences that we have, we're going to air out and we're going to do that in front of people and let, you know, everybody in the audience continue to hold us accountable for what we're doing. Um, it, it, yeah, I, I think that the, the 10% that are less than stoked about it, um, there there's myriad different reasons some of us are just flat out unlikable i guess <clears throat> you know and there's people that just really have that, deep-seated feelings true. about some of us that's not true steve james <laughs> corbett is a very likable person he is a I've very like to him myself yeah a yeah, very likable person i mean you know and i i get along with, with everyone that I know in there, I, I have a lot of respect for Catherine Austin Fitz, but I haven't had a conversation with her yet. Mm. would like to. Um, what I've seen from Carrie Wedler, I really like. You know, she, she's, got, uh, she's got some great content out there. Uh, and she took a break for a while, but she's slowly starting to come back into it. The knowledge base that's contained in it, just between Corbett and Whitney Webb and Richard Grove is immense, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it, it's an opportunity for me, at least, to like <coughs> sit in a room with a whole bunch of people that I consider to be way smarter than me and just kind of absorb, you know, what, what they have to offer. And really, it, it really is about 90-10 in terms of yeah, it's a little bit different on am wake up like we don't actually get saturated with like trolls or backbiting assholes or any of that stuff uh, the chat is savage uh, and they kind of you know they kind of handle it uh, and so it's not a lot of people just coming in i'm so shadow banned on freaking twitter that i don't have the the hater base that a lot of these people do um, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in a little bit different position than somebody like Ryan who has to go out there and like literally do battle every time he logs on, um, but, which I feel very fortunate for. I do. I, I would, I don't want to add that kind of stress to my life. I don't. No, I don't think so, any so of far us do. been very, very positive overall. And the interactions that I've had where people are negative it's you know usually out of a genuinely good place that that people have healthy skepticism so i don't you know i don't mind that at all either and, and again i'm you know happy to have those conversations um i think over the course of the next several months a lot of those suspicions and you know hesitation or whatever is going to be uh, assuaged just by the nature of the conversations that we're having and the fact that we are keeping it, you know, 100% free for everybody. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, the, the only thing we can do is uh, see how it plays out, right? Yeah. Because nobody <clears throat> knows the future. I, I would like to think that with uh, uh, this particular group, with everybody's own personal goals for what they're doing with their own projects and what people want to see uh, take place you know, culturally or societally uh, at large, it's going to provide the opportunity for a ton more people to network um, when they haven't, they haven't been able to do that as easily in the past. And there's a lot of different, uh, I don't know, tools and technologies that we have available to us in order to get that done. So it's going to be more of an information sharing and networking hub than really anything else. All with the end goal being P 
people getting away from the technocratic state and people learning uh, how to, you know, do a whole bunch of different skill sets that, that are going to be vital for that. And, uh, the, the concept of freedom cells is so freaking cool. The, the practical reality of it is that most people don't want to get together to do that. Most people want to get together to party. Right. You know, but the conceptually, it's a fantastic idea. And I, I see some of what, you know, from the discussions that we're having, um, a push towards, you know, really wanting to try and involve as many people as possible and get as many different, not just, you know, voices or, you know, content creators or whatever in there, but like get as many people in real life activated and doing things about it as opposed to just 14, 15 hours a day watching you know, different shows on, on freaking Rumble or Rockfin or whatever, and then just going to sleep and waking up and doing that all over again. Right. Are there people that actually do that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's people that just consume content. And they might even be supportive. They might, you know, even to the point of, of you know, being, you know, producers or donors or whatever. Um, but that's the end of it and again the the audience that we build up over the years that's not that's not you know those guys at all like the we, all the time we get people i'll get emails from people from the show that are like oh hey i went and did this or i was at this event or i did that you know picked up um a new skill set or I'm learning how to do this or now I'm welding today and stuff like that. And that's really encouraging when people like slim talks about all the time, change their consumption model, huge changes take place. Uh, and I, I really like, that's the most encouraging thing for me is that I've been able to watch a whole bunch of people change their consumption models and, you know, live life differently. And it's having purely positive impacts for them. Awesome. So how, how did you get together with uh, Texas slim in the first place? I've always wondered. I heard him on no agenda. No. Uh, uh, they are. I heard uh, Adam Curry talking about him on no agenda. Okay. I don't, I don't think he was actually on, um, but Adam was gassing up the beef initiative and talking about what Slim was doing and, you know, one man mission to reconnect America with their ranchers. And I was like, holy shit, that sounds dope. So uh, I reached out to him, I think on Twitter and was just like, hey, dude, you have a fascinating story and I would like to have you on the show. And uh, he was he was on a couple of times, a couple of, you know, I think about three years ago. Uh, is when I first had him on. And then over the last couple of years, that's developed into more regular appearances. And uh, yeah, the, that's about how that went. So, but yeah, all credit to Adam Curry. Hail Podfather. Yeah, well, I mean, he's uh, a lot of roads begin uh, at the feet of Adam Curry. It's, it's kind of astounding. So, he just wrapped up a hundred episodes of uh, the show that he was doing uh, with Mo uh, Fax, man. with Mo Fax, and That's now so he's moved on to uh, like what podcasting is becoming, mm -hmm. and I'm interested to see how that goes because I would imagine it's going to be fairly cynical. Oh yeah, I would imagine. It's interesting that that you mentioned Mo Fax with Adam Curry because I reached out to Mo. I don't know, it was maybe about a month ago. Like we've communicated back and forth on Twitter for uh, a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, said, Hey man, it's, cause I, I knew they were going to stop at a hundred. And I was like, Hey, as soon as you guys get done, maybe you want to come on and uh, talk about the experience. And he was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Reach back out. I was like, awesome. We'll do that. So you heard it here first folks. Uh, eventually we're going to get Mo Fax on here. That guy's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard him uh, going back and forth with uh, Hotep Jesus or not, but it is oh yeah, hilarious, <laughs> so hilarious. Hotep Jesus is a character too, man. Oh yeah, that guy's a character. 
Well, we had, uh, I had uh, Uncle Hotep on uh, for an interview almost exactly a year ago because it was the day before I left Acapulco. Okay. Yeah. That, that, was, uh, that was a very entertaining interview as well. I'm probably going to have to get him back on at some point. Heck yeah. I've been on a couple of Union of the Unwanted's with Hotep Jesus, but he just sort of steamrolled and then bounced. That sounds about right. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even know he was on that. Yeah, he's been on a couple of times. That show's freaking four years old now. Yeah. Union of the Unwanted. Yeah. Wow. Were you on crazy. the episode with Roseanne? Yes, I was. What were and that your episode impressions? Was, uh, Roseanne was out of control. Just out of control. It, it was already like she had already been, I don't know if she was partying or whatever. I think she was kind of hammered. Um, her camera wasn't working. She was already in a mood. And then, uh, yeah, she was just, she was ready to scrap with just about anybody. And uh, I was chaos. It was absolute chaos. Um, her rant about lesbian witches in Hollywood was one of the funniest things I've heard in a while. And then when she, um, when she snapped on homeboy and told him to suck her fat Jew cock, I about fucking lost it. I really did. I about lost it. That was good stuff. So, yeah. Wait, who was, who did she snap on? Oh my God, dude. I can't, I can't remember his was name. Was it not a regular? Like it wasn't Charlie. No, 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 uh, no. It was somebody she knew, and then when, uh, like, he's a comedy writer. He's been around forever. He's in his sixties too. Um, and I can't remember what his name is off the top of my head. But when it came out, what she was actually mad at him for, it was because he didn't give her last comedy special enough of a glowing review. Yeah. Okay. Like it was the most petty, you know, freaking stand up comic bullshit. Yeah, and, and that all that almost made it funnier to me. Like the, it had nothing to do with the original point she was making. It had nothing to do with what she said she was yelling at him for. Right. Finally it came it. out. Yeah. Yo, oh, yeah. She'd been sitting on it for like I think seven or eight years or something oh, like wow. that. That animosity. Wow. And, and was able to, yeah. And then at the end of it, she's like, I love you. You're one of my, you know, you're one of my favorite people. She's like, Dude, come on. What the fuck just happened? Yeah, that was great. A lot of people were, were caught off guard. The looks on everybody's faces when Roseanne just started screaming and berating that dude and all of the profanity that was peppered in it. Oh, yeah. uh, the look on Sam's face was priceless. Yeah, because he was he was responsible for bringing most of those people on. Although Mel K was the one who got Roseanne to come on, because they're like buddy buddies. Which I don't, you know, that's cool. I guess. I mean, we Maggot. all need friends, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I Mel's got <clears throat> Mel's hard for me to to figure out because I've heard her say a lot of shit that makes sense. Mm -hmm. On Union of the Unwanted. And then I watch her show and it's a Trump rally. Yeah. Well, because she's pandering. I guess, man. I mean, that's the only thing I can figure at this point. Uh, unless uh, maybe maybe she actually believes that, you know, he's going to save the Republic. They're, those people are walking around in the world. They are. I, it's, I don't know what evidence they have for that. None. They don't. We, they don't have any. We already you ask lived. them for it. They can't present any. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we already had that guy as president. Right. I know that people's, you know, bank accounts were a little bit better off than they are now, but ah, not a lot. I don't know. I don't know what world they were living in, but yeah, dude, I have this conversation with Sugar all the time. When she's like, oh, well, I paid less in gas and I have more money. 
you know, and that's that's her memory of the Trump presidency. And I'm like, he locked down the entire the entire country, gave five trillion dollars to some bankster buddies, freaking was printing money hand over fist, going all the way back to really 2017, but 2019 mm. it exploded. And Steve Mnuchin was one of the most, like at least in terms of the the money printer go burr, he was one of the most liberal minded people about it. It was a freaking printing spree. Well, yeah, especially once they they got the uh, inverse signal in like what was it like August? I think. Mm hmm. Yeah. And they were like, "Oh shit." Yeah. And then just the floodgates went open on it. The, so all that's going to do over time is devalue the currency. I don't care how many trillions you give to your buddies, you know, that's going to, until they convert it into different assets, all it's going to do is weaken it. And that's what it's done. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It is. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what Donald Trump, the, they, they think exists. But it's not the one that was president for four years. It's some mm -hmm. sort of avatar that they've created. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's their. I mean, it's their golden calf, essentially. Yeah. With a silver crown. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I I chose those words advisedly. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, again, I know he is the golden child of Israel. He's he's the one that is. Uh, you know, he's going to save. Uh, well, the chosen people, the rest of us are screwed. So I don't know, you know, why all these people are running around loving him because he's not prophesized to save them. Right. No. Well, and if, you know, if the marketing about the Moshiach is any kind of accurate, that is the Christian Antichrist. Right. They just uh, was briefly on Nature Boy's show. He had Donut on there. Uh, and that was like right out the gate. We got into that a little bit. Um, and Dave asked him if Trump was the Antichrist. And uh, it, I get, you know, as far as as far as I'm concerned, no. As far as I'm concerned, Elon checks off more boxes for that than Trump does. Um, but Donut brought up a good point that at least according to, you know, biblical scholars, the Antichrist is going to be like universally loved. Hmm. And neither Trump nor Musk are any kind of universally loved. Uh, they got huge hater fan, but you know, hater bases. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe it doesn't have to roll out exactly like scripture or prophecy or whatever says that's right. all open to interpretation too. But it is really weird that the rabbis went to work on Sabbath to crown Donald Trump. Uh, and it's also weird that, you know, they named a neighborhood in the Golan after him. Mm -hmm. And now we're uh, the Golans in Lebanon anyway. It's uh, not well, even. He moved quote, the unquote, embassy to Jerusalem. Moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, and then also, you know. Uh, basically said, you know, we'll give you whatever you want, whenever you want it. And he's been running around for the last almost year because we're coming up uh, 10 days away from October 7th. Yeah. Uh, you know, running around for the last year saying, you know, the, oh, they're not treating Israel right. They just gave him another $8.7 billion. You know, but oh, yeah, yeah, too soft, too soft, too much Hamas appeasement. And let's go ahead and give them whatever was so they can finish the job. That's what he said when he did the sit down with the two rabbis uh, and several months back. It was like, yeah, you guys need whatever, whatever you want to finish the job, but you should get out there and do that. Well, that can only mean expansion of the greater Israel project. That that's what finishing the job is, and his son-in-law is front and center on all kinds of brand new real estate after the rubbleization of Gaza, the fifteen-minute city experiments that are going to rise up from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big freaking money laundering scheme with the paid in blood. 
Yeah. And the great the great thing about flattening entire city blocks, I don't know if, if most people know this, you probably do, having been a, a carpenter and a contractor, Steve. You can rebuild it any way you want. Any way you want. Yup. And <clears throat> I know uh, Rich has been talking about how you know, it's Planet Gaza now. Um, and, and I think... I mean, dude, how how generated do you think this hurricane is? Mm. This one, I don't know. I haven't I haven't been paying extremely close attention to it. Um, its path seems a little suspect. Like I'm I'm trying to remember in my lifetime when we've had a hurricane that came from the Gulf made a landfall in Florida and continued moving North. And then at some point decided to just turn West Mm -hmm. that just kind of seems to defy history. Well, and also the way that it's still gaining momentum and gaining strength post landfall. Oh yeah, there's uh, Yona texted me earlier today. He lost power in Ohio from the winds. Yeah, yeah. like that's that's abnormal. And, and so, do the degree of how legitimately unnatural that is, I you know I can't I can't say with certainty. But the one that landed in Max Egan's backyard. Oh, that was completely unnatural. Uh, yeah, I mean, it took a ninety degree turn. Well, not uh, only that, it entered Acapulco Bay. Yeah. Like, for folks who, who don't know what that phrase really means, go and look up Acapulco Bay and look at the geography of the mm-hmm. land. There is absolutely no way a hurricane should ever enter Acapulco Bay. It, it's it's literally a zero percent chance that that will ever happen just from the lay and, of the land and then with this one i saw where uh the sheriffs in a couple of florida towns were like okay look if you're not gonna evacuate i need you to get a permanent marker and write your details somewhere on your body so when we come collect it we'll have a way of identifying you oh wow you don't think that was just them being dicks i mean possibly but that they were that seemed to be very serious about it Hmm. you know like you know we can't we can't necessarily make you leave but we would at least like you to scrawl out your personal information and permanent marker on your arm so that when we find you you know and and that's that that's a first the first time i've ever heard anything like that Um, but yeah, I mean, if they're expecting that kind of severity, especially that far in, you know, past landfall, the, to me signals that there's a significant harpiness going on with these weather systems. I wouldn't doubt that, uh, so much, but I, I'm also of the opinion that we're going through uh, a natural cycle where we're likely to see increased extreme weather events like hurricanes, um, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, all that sort of stuff. Um, like, it's like hard uh, to determine, you know? Like a Yuga cycle thing or just through because of you know, the way that weather patterns work? Well, not necessarily just the way the weather patterns work. That's a part of it. But you also factor in the weakening magnetic field, um, not just of planet Earth, but of, of uh, essentially everything in our solar system based on, you know, not my opinion, but on data that is being put forth from actual astrophysicists. they Electromagnetic fields are weakening all across the solar system. 
that mm. is going to allow for more energy to come into the atmosphere from outside of the planet, I would imagine, which would then have a uh, strengthening effect on these types of systems because you're introducing more energy into the system at that point. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it made, it makes sense. It does. And they, you know, tell us that the poles are shifting and that, you know, there's, uh, what, it flipped or in the core, something like that. There was a flip that took place. And, I, if, you say. know, yeah, if that's accurate, then you would kind of expect some pretty hectic geological events to be occurring. Right. Um they keep telling us that we're due for here in California, that we're due for another massive earthquake. Uh, I hope not, but I don't see anything that, you know, would preclude that or stop, you know, that you, there's tectonic plate activity. I, I think you can only exacerbate that. I don't think you can slow it down. You want to take some phone calls? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. All right, guys, I'm putting the link into the Telegram channel right now. I'll go ahead and forward it over to the new prisoners as well as the AM wake up channel. And for our regulars, I'll get you guys some links here in just a second. And we'll get some more people in on this. Heck yeah. So there's kid activity going on oh, out something. in the hallway. Dude, if if you've ever watched any any broadcast on Liberty Radio, like we don't give a fuck about background noise. Winter yeah. time, like I, I have a heater that's gonna be about five feet behind me that'll be blowing constantly, and you'll hear it. And mm -hmm. I make no apology for it. Yeah, nor should you. Nor should you. I have a fan on right now. It was you know, 85 in the Bay today, which is, I know, I know, I know, but it's hot. Okay. It's hot. Well, it depends on how much humidity you have. Yeah. And it's, you know, <clears throat> not the best air circulation in, in the place here. So it's a little bit stuffier, but it just sort of hangs out. Um, and I, I hate how California soft I have become as far as the weather goes, but I'll take 85 being hot as opposed to the 117 that it was in Sonora in July. There were, I think 20 days it, in the month of July in gold country where it was a hundred degrees or more. I believe it. Yeah. But it, it's, it's it was, high desert. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was hot as fuck here this summer. Like we we went above 70 degrees back sometime I think late April early May and mm -hmm. the temperature never dipped below it again until just a couple days ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. There've been some nice mornings here when it's been like, you know, mid 50s or something like that and legitimately cooler. But they're few and far between. What's going on, Rob? Good to see you, buddy. Hi, Steve. What's going on, Driz? What's going on, Rob? What's on your going mind tonight, my man? First, uh, survival, I guess. I mean, you guys are painting a bleak picture of uh, geoengineered storms and uh, collapse of the dollar. I'm over here trying to get my oh, uh, baby chickens laying some eggs and... Uh, Trying to figure out what the fuck I'm going to do in the wintertime to grow something. But, you know, part of the, the uh, trying to find a solution rather than bitching about all the problems we know about. Heck yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it is kind of a, a, a bleak picture. But again, it's, you know, not the only one that we get to look at. Uh, and you're making your own in your own space. That's what we all need to be doing. Well, you're real, I'm convinced it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is it's supposed to be bleak by design because people are supposed to lose hope and check out and, and just get absorbed back into the system. That's that's the whole point. 
Well, it's the whole humiliation ritual that's going on. <laughs> I uh, I believe what Yuri said to a degree. I mean, not you know, hundred percent, but he pretty much had a a formula. Brezhnikov. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it wasn't his formula. It was the KGB's formula. He was just relating it to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and demoralization and destabilization is you know, historically like what the, you know, ag economic hitmen campaigns were. Mm -hmm. um, it's what a lot of, you know, the, the various coups or attempted coups and getting NGOs in on the ground floor early on to sort of set up these organizations uh, civically that are there specifically to rot and they're to demoralize the population. I was on critical hour earlier uh, and I said something to the effect of like our foreign policy has become our domestic policy and everything okay. that the U S has traditionally been, been doing to, you know, the global South largely um, is now happening here and has been for a number of years. And uh, the you know, f simple fact of the matter is it doesn't matter which puppet they install in a month, that puppet is going to continue the policies of demoralization and destabilization and, you know, uh, na native replacement as more and more people croak off from the mRNA treatments. It's going to be more and more immigrants that are replacing them in whatever pocket of society that they're in. And that's not me being, you know, anti-immigrant or anything like that. It's just relaying reality because it's already happening. Well, the, so, the joke's on them because uh, most people who come from these other countries have had to work their ass off most of their lives to do anything to even fucking eat. So when they come here, they're going to see that, you know, we don't want to, you know, we're working and we're paying taxes on this shit. We don't want to give away our fucking labor to the fucking state. <laughs> it's one way of looking at it. It's, a, it's, a, it's the optimistic way of looking at it, at least. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. I don't know. I, I, there, there's a handful of different ways that it could go. And <clears throat> you're never, I'm not going to say never, but it's going to be significantly harder to get a, you know, a, an American military to go after other Americans. Mm -hmm. But if you have people that have no, you know, connection to the culture who aren't from here, who you've given a pathway to citizenship, for joining the military so that you can then go get revenge on the local population for what they did to your population, which is what brought you here in the first place is U S foreign mm -hmm. policy. The, then that's certainly another way that that ball could bounce. Yeah. I remember, I can't remember which uh, Senator or Congress person was uh, talking about it, but you know, it was making a plea to the people, the immigrants, that if you uh, served in the uh, military, that you'd get instant citizenship. It's like, there, there's only one reason why you would be doing that. I mean, first off, they can't get anybody to join because they've pumped everybody full of fucking atrazine and glyphosate and every other endocrine disrupting chemical to make everybody ambiguously gay. And, uh, the whole next generation coming up is in like a bad fucking state unless they were living somewhere outside of the fluoridization of the water. And I mean, I don't know how far you can get away from the poisoning, but it's, it's like, it really is epidemic level. It, it's like you, you would think that some of these grifters would actually have the consciousness with their um, popularity to do something about it. But, People are fucking so greedy. <laughs> it, I, I don't know. Is it fucking evil? Is it greed? What the fuck is it? It's all of the that above. Ever... I mean, it. people can be controlled under a, dumb, a number of different mechanisms, right? It doesn't always have to be money. Uh, but people, when they attach their emotions to physical things they leave themselves open to being leveraged. It doesn't even matter what the thing is. 
They, they just have to consider that thing to be more important than everything else. Yeah. And they're done yeah. at that point. Hi, Gomez. What's up? You Got like me? about 530 at least Congress scumbags with uh, impact handlers who've obviously done something that's got them on the hook. <laughs> no, <laughs> some yeah. Diddy party or an Epstein party trip to the island right or some money or, they took or I'm sure there's a bunch of people we've yeah. never even heard of that are doing the same fucking thing in different scenarios so yeah it it's been i don't know it's been it been fun and will continue to be fun to watch hollywood burn though oh, I, yes. I am enjoying that yeah that, that has been particularly pleasurable to witness I'm sure it'll be a controlled burn because the, the CIA has been off and that I shit. I don't know if they have much choice at this point, Rob. I mean, they're <laughs> putting out garbage, like absolute fucking garbage. Like, have you seen the box office numbers lately? I, I don't, I never pay attention to that shit. Like, no, nobody's watching it. Nobody. Well, it's all it's all sequels and reboots, and there's no originality. The only time you get any sort of semblance of creativity. Oh shit! We lost your audio again, Steve. Uh, How about now? Yeah, you're you back. Okay. Yeah, it's all it's all uh, sequels and remakes, and the the only creativity you see or originality you see the comes woke, out of anime now. The woke version. <laughs> yeah, woke woke <laughs> busters and freaking let's yeah, what <clears throat> make it gay and make it lame. Hmm? Uh, that was the the Disney motto. Um, be, there's a, I mean, look, the J Jones Plantation, because it's, you know, out of the Hollywood bubble, is probably the most impactful movie that's been put out over the last five or ten years. Um, maybe sorry to bother you uh, if you were, you know, picking up on all of the cues in there. Um, but there aren't many. There aren't many. And, and so, yeah, the, if you've raised up an industry... And the only thing that's left is the debauchery. All of the creativity is gone. All of the, you know, everything that would make a movie good has been either woked out of it or, you know, just had the life sucked out of it. Then maybe it is. Maybe the, the controlled part that you were talking about, Rob, is the, the rug pull for that. I don't know. There's uh, the pendulum that goes back and forth to the uh, super liberal, then back to the ultra conservative. And it seems like they just keep playing that out over the decades. But it, generally, that the fake liberalism has uh, been the, the prevalent thing. I mean, if you look at the elections over the course of like the last 50 years plus. Hmm. Yeah, you can see the, the pendulum swing throughout history. It, the, the thing about Hollywood that I have been suspecting for a long time, because again, I found out about the transformation in media uh, and especially broadcasting that was going to take place like 10 years ago. I knew all of this shit was coming 10 years ago uh, and that eventually cable was going to die and would no longer be in existence and everything would be on the internet, especially essentially on demand. Some things you might have to pay for some things you might not, uh, but it's basically going to be a la carte, get it wherever you can, however you want it. And you know, um, no physical copies for you. Correct. Correct. Um, because that was the only explanation for why companies like Verizon were buying media production companies because otherwise it just doesn't did not make any sense for their business model you know they, I, they've had this plan for a while but i'm I, thinking I, maybe they didn't let hollywood in on the plan or at least the 
you know, the, the lower level 99%. As stupid as the whole WEF, you know, fake uh, bad guy like Klaus Schwab, the fucking Galactic Empire <laughs> Emperor, I'm sorry. But it, it's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous that their fucking stupid fucking plans somehow do trickle down to what the government's trying to do. I mean, they're not in charge of shit they're just out there to make everybody you know they can call people conspiracy theorists because nobody will watch the videos of what they actually say and it's it's just so fucking dumb this the well and it so <clears throat> they're they're supposed to be largely distracting people from what the un is doing as an unelected body and the policies that are being set on a you know international level um and the the wef and the un are connected the wef is an off you know offshoot of the un um but they do basically what what they do is serve as the intermediaries between the bank of international settlements the international monetary fund world bank stuff like that uh and then they go and they tell the politicians what they're going to do right and, the heads and they of the do that as well yeah they do that years in advance if you go back and look at the milken institute talk that fauci gave in 2019 where he was talking about getting the world off of your traditional uh, yeah, yeah, egg-based vaccines and that kind of thing and going to the mRNA model. Uh, the, the script has already been written for those guys. It hasn't already been written for us. Like the, All they're ever going to do is follow orders and be good little servants to power. Yeah, but they don't, they don't really need a script for us. Because, again, they already have archetypes. They know how we're going to react based on the archetype that we choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is why you got to be a fucking wild card in this exactly. shit. Yeah. The, the, and, and I understand to like varying degrees what we're doing in the independent media, the actual independent media. It's stuff that these clowns have like tried to game out or gamify at least. Um, but <clears throat> even the, you know, even the, the tune that people were singing five years ago, it wasn't necessarily get out there and establish relationships with people in your community or people who are growing and producing food that people weren't talking about that. Gomez, if you go for that pizza, I swear to God, I will smack you in your giant head. <laughs> no that's a no wag 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 yeah the, hey do, what are you doing what are you doing yeah he's gonna go for it he's yeah. he's trying to like angle his tail yeah so that it'll tip the plate yeah and he's that's almost there okay dude back off but you gotta back off you do. You're cute. Dude, Go away. The pities are way smarter than people give them credit for. Oh, well, that's because they act stupid, too. I know. They try to fool you. They try to lull you into an, oh, big dumb dog's not going to do that. And then he totally does. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he knows way more words than people think he does. And he is way smarter than he looks. But, you know, he also looks like a big, goofy, freaking gremlin. So, you know, there's that. Go lay down, dude. This fucker, he ground scored, like, uh, one of the, the PG&E was doing work down the street all last week. And he ground scored, like, a half a sandwich. Nice. And I'm like, dude, you're going to die. You're gonna die. You can't just eat stuff off the ground like that. It's I mean, not gonna be sandwich, good man. It's not gonna work out. It's not. Take but he does not try to get roadkill. <laughs> That's the best. That reminds me yeah. of when Briar Rose found the floor cheese that had been there for 
we don't know how how long. That was a fun thing to clean up. Wow. It's everywhere. I bet. Absolutely fucking everywhere. I bet. Gomez horked up some sweet potato or some white sweet potato earlier. So how, do you guys, how do you guys feel about 70% of the people who consider themselves Democrats are for censorship uh, and the government to regulate that censorship? What? Gallup poll? I can't remember. What are uh, they trying to program people with? It was... Uh, it was probably a redacted, which, you know, is, uh, you know, where they lean, but it was something I was watching while I was eating my lunch, flipping through stupid YouTube videos. Oh. While I was on the couch. So were they presenting it as like a legitimate poll as in, this is what people actually think. Gallup poll. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't that one of the, yeah. Uh, so I saw that not, not the, yeah, the actual poll or the write up about the poll. I saw that. <clears throat> And I do believe that if you were to ask seven out of 10 Democrats in any given room or scenario, what their views on, you know, internet censorship and stuff like that would be, I did, they're, they're primed for being pro censorship. They have been, you know, for at least eight years, it, there was a brief period oh, yeah. where being anti-censorship just meant you were anti-Bush. And Obama put the entire left to sleep for like eight years. And then uh, with the DNC emails and the Podesta emails and all of those WikiLeaks drops, that's when you really saw the Democrat Party go hard for censorship. And they haven't let up from that. And they've been able to raise up a whole new generation of, you know, squad progressives and stuff like that who are vehemently pro censorship. Yeah, you know, those those guys. These are the people that celebrated when um, Alex Jones got deplatformed the first time, or you know, we're sitting there calling for people like Corbett to be yanked off of the internet and stuff like that. Uh, so I did the, the number sounds pretty accurate to me, you know, and I don't put a lot of stock in polling, but I do think that if you went to, I don't know, a Bruce Springsteen concert <laughs> and you were just to take a, a snap poll of the, you know, freaking boomers and liberals that populate that event, most of them would have very negative things to say about uh, Twitter in general, Elon Musk specifically, and any or all of the people that were allowed back on the platform uh, and so that they could do right-wing propaganda. But it's always just the opposite political ideology that they want censored, you know, and they don't think about it. They don't think about what any of the long-term implications of it would be. It's just acting purely on emotion based on what they've been told to be afraid of or be angry about. And if you can get them isolated and have a conversation with them, most of them actually recognize that there are some serious problems going on that their party is never going to solve. But it's, you know, political bubble season, selection season. So you got to put on your jersey and show up to the stadium and root for your team. Otherwise, you know, what are you even doing with your life? Yeah. And they've tried to make... Uh... I, I mean, th th this is my thesis on the whole thing with Trump is that they've taken populist uh, ideas that probably 70 percent of the population actually agrees with. And they've tried to associate that with him. And the other side is like stolen some of them. But for, for the most part, they're the anti that. And if you they, they've tried to make anybody associated with Trump because he's you know the only option in the duopoly if you're right-leaning and they've tried to demonize those values uh consistently and it's really fucking scary i mean the propaganda that they're using on people like you watch those mm -hmm. clips of all the fucking news stations saying the same shit and um the, the last one from orfala when they were you know biden's state of the union 
about how fiery and you know sharp he was it was just like holy fuck man i don't watch the news so like i don't i don't get that but i know people that do and they are still stuck in that whole fucking belief system even though mm-hmm. that you know vaccine has affected them personally they they still watch that and think that these people are like not getting paid to lie to them and you know it hurts you on a certain level because they're, they're good people and you, you don't want to see them like succumb to this stupid shit but it's like here they we made go. they made us watch biden's u.n speech <clears throat> for critical hour today oh my oh dude it was i mean basically if you if you were if somebody asked you 10 or 15 years ago to write out what a tyrant on the way out of an empire that is clearly being dissolved what he would say it's a lot like what Joe Biden coughed out for the UN. I mean, it, you know, uh, saber rattly, arrogant, uh, full of hubris and basically saying, you know, no, there's no way that we're ever going to stop being team America world police. And there's no, there's no will for it. There's no political will for that in the United States and an ever decreasing, we talked about it earlier. No, matter, matter of fact, there's, military size. Yeah. There's a, a growing portion of the population. I would say based on what I've seen, that is very unhappy with the, the funds that are leaving the country and going elsewhere. When we've got all kinds of problems of our own that need to be solved. And it kind yeah. of, it almost seems like it's being done deliberately to like incite slapped, those people. Slapped right in their face. Yeah. 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 Well, and I mean, to, to that point, when you have debilitated the infra, you have, you know, debilitated infrastructure, when your civic institutions are exposing themselves as being you know, nothing more than like intelligence cutouts and money laundering operations. Uh, and your government in the face of that is going, we're going to hand, you know, $5,000 gift cards to illegal immigrants. We're going to put them up in hotels. We're going to kick your kid out of school so that we can house people there instead all of these things are deliberate eye pokes uh, and they're designed to elicit uh, the kind of response that requires force to tamper. And that's just another mechanism by which you get, you know, 15 minute cities and you get the entire country to where you can lock them down the whole push to eliminate gas stoves, increase surveillance, increase control. Yeah. yeah, Larry Ellison coming out and saying we're going to have nuclear powered data centers that monitor you that only exist to store what's collected on your 24 hour a day monitoring. But hey, you'll be on your best behavior when we're watching you all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's so, just creepy, by the way. Very creepy. Anybody would want to know what another person is doing. 24 hours a day is creepy by nature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the, the many nuclear reactors powering data centers all over the, the country Driz? <clears throat> what could possibly go wrong? Well, right. I, I've known for at least 20 years that they could build thorium reactors and, uh, not produce a bunch of toxic waste or the meltdown effects and they don't do it because they can use nuclear um, power stations to enrich uranium into nuclear grade stuff or uh, weapons grade stuff so yeah i don't i don't think thorium makes for very effective bombs it's no pretty that, hard to blow up small brown children with thorium from what i hear 
And I mean, they can always make bullets out of the depleted uranium and shoot it at those said kids. It's, uh, it's okay because uh, Madeleine Albright said that, you know, it was worth it. It was worth yeah. it. Half a million dead Iraqi kids. It's totally worth it. Yeah, we believe it was worth it. Like, how how could a human being get up there with any feeling and say that shit? That, how, how much money? <laughs> I, well, mean, I, I, I think that's where you screwed up, Rob. Some... I, I don't think Madeline Albright was considered human. At least, no, at least not during like my lifetime. Country. Yeah. Hearing those motherfuckers in my young years, you know, my 20s, <laughs> help form the opinions I have now. And through a lot of reading and other stuff, it's just you know, watching this whole fucking clown show play out. Dude, Donald Rumsfeld still uh, will will forever be like one of the most evil people to walk this planet, and he oh, yeah. just like he really looked like a comic book villain. He really did, even more so than Klaus Schwab in the freaking you know Space Ranger getup. Like, <clears throat> and, and I still like I'll still find that people don't know the role that he played in, in getting aspartame on the market. Oh yeah. 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 And I mean, that was a you know situation where he went directly from the state department to, to the board of a corporation that put poison in the products of an entire generation, if not two generations of children and adults. Yeah. And then went right back in to the freaking defense department <laughs> where he got to take part in a number of illegal wars along with the entire freaking uh, Iran Contra scandal. Yeah. And the whole reason that he went to GD Searle in the first place was to make sure that aspartame got approved. Yep. Yeah. And uh, if you read like the studies, like they cut the tumors out of the rats before they presented them, <laughs> the dead rats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, Whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah. I, hopefully, eventually, history will recognize Rumfeld as Rumsfeld is one of the worst human beings ever. I mean, but, maybe after a fucking collapse of this bullshit. I, you know, how, I don't know how you can control chaos. I don't think they have enough robots that uh, people can't take out to take everybody's place at this point. So, when, if this country um, were to crash, I see more of a slow decline. Turn people on each other. People can't eat. They start attacking their neighbors kind of thing. I could, I could see a balkanization happening over the course of quarter century. I, yeah. I, I think I think the the conditions are fairly ripe. For, for a scenario like that to play out at this particular moment to where the country breaks up into, I don't know, five, six, maybe ten, you know, different confederations or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that the federal government would like, would prefer to see a sort of districting of the territory rather than balkanization but i don't know how much control over that they ultimately have you know like if people actually really do just wake up one morning and start popping off um then the potential for balkanization is much more possible but i, I do i think they would way rather prefer to have us in like basically hunger games-esque you know districts <clears throat> Uh, ultimately based around what sort of, uh, you know, energy supply or the data center housing uh, is, uh, is required of, you know, any specific geographical area, um, which is why we should go ahead and reclaim Jefferson right now. Right now, we should do that. The state of Jefferson back in action, go ahead and claim Northern California and a little bit of Southern Oregon, uh, and just you know, fortify. <laughs> it's crazy though because the entire coast is a military base, so that's going to be rough.
It's going to be I an mean, interesting. You're, you're, you're solving a one state problem. I'm thinking more of a new constitutional convention where we bring people together and just uh, decide we're not going to fucking be ruled by these people anymore. Everything is so fucking controlled. I, I don't know how many people are actually on board with this shit, how many fucking fake votes that they put in. And they they control the voting systems. Like everybody knows that the Dominion voting systems can be hacked. Well, they count the votes. Yeah, when so you it count- doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how people vote at all. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> and even if it wasn't rigged on a fucking national level, you have people that are so like ideologically opposed to the other fucking side that they'll fucking do it, you know, willingly and free if they get the opportunity. Yeah, I mean the the problem with a a new constitutional convention uh, is the vast majority of people at this moment would be looking to like Brett and Eric Weinstein <laughs> or Eric Schmidt or Elon Musk to be the leaders of that as opposed to the people that need to be drummed out of any position of real or perceived power to begin with in the first place. Like people don't think that people, uh, not everybody certainly, and definitely not anybody watching this show, but the vast majority of normies are walking around out there comfortable in the fact that other people are making their decisions for them. Hmm. That's you know, as long as they have control over what series they're going to binge watch or, you know, the number of restaurants they can order from from DoorDash, then those are, you know, controlled decisions that they're comfortable making. But the ones that actually impact their communities, they've been happy to outsource. They've outsourced their entire mode of thinking. That's nail on the head right there. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, it's pretty wild. I uh, I don't know, man. I most most people would prefer to not exist in like chaos or uncertainty or anything like that. And I understand it. I do, but that's the only way that you get any sort of like growth or change. You have to experience that chaos. You have to experience that adversity. And if you have character, then you power through it and you come out of it with a, a much, much better understanding. And I, people are just fucking soft now, man. Oh, the, yeah. that, the vaccine mandate shit. I, I watched, you know, people I work with just fucking cave because they didn't want to lose their job. They didn't want to make a fuss. And it's like, all you have to do is say no. Yeah. I mean, I, I used a religious exemption to get myself out of it, but like so many, you know, good people I know who were against it, went and did it against their will so they could keep their fucking job. And that's what fucking scares me about the population as a whole. Like they're smart individuals, but when you start getting mm. to that group fucking think mentality, then, uh, you know, witches get burned. <laughs> well, well, yes, yes, because there, there's always the threat of the mob, right? Um, but the other thing, too, is when you know that people are afflicted with herd mentality, they're very easy to manipulate. Very, very easy. Because they're basically dumb animals, and they're happy being that way. Well, I, I took the opportunity during a town hall with the 400 infrastructure people in my company that were there to ask a question at the town hall when that stuff was happening. And I said, um, you know, the typical policy when you give notices, you can only get you know paid out four weeks of vacation. So if I get fired for not taking this vaccine, um, should I quit now because I'm like in that window or should I or are you guys going to honor my vacation time and pay me out at the end? <laughs> what but, did they say? Uh, they said, uh, "Oh, uh, the the it was the CIO at the time." He's like, "Oh, I'm sure they'll uh, they'll t- they'll honor that." And I was like, "Okay, well, you know, let me know." And then I had a conversation with him. Um, he called me directly, 
and was trying to, you know, tell me how, uh, you know, you got a bright career here and, you know, you don't want to, if you go somewhere else, they could mandate it too. And I was like, well, I'm a single father and I can't afford to lose uh, my livelihood as far as I can't work anymore for some untested vaccine. He's like, well, I understand your concerns, but I was like, well, I put in a religious exemption. If they approve it, then I guess, you know, I'm good. And they did, fortunately. I it's just crazy the people had to be shoved into, you know, those kinds of decisions in the first place. Like, it, I don't, I don't know what evidence has been put forward to suggest that any vaccine is good for you, let alone the mRNA treatments. And I don't, I, I don't know what. I mean, yes, I know because massive fucking propaganda and you know mind control campaign, but I, I can't for the life of me figure out how that works other than people get told very, very early on that these things are good for you. And it's just never a question that people have to ask again until one of them gets injured. Right. And then the moment you become vaccine injured, you're immediately shunned by everybody because you talked about the thing that happened to you. And everyone knows that that's not what those products do. Those products save lives. You must be crazy. Yeah. But the, the thing that's like worked against that, which has been like a, a tidal wave recently, is the video evidence. Because back when it first started affecting kids, people didn't have cell phones ready and have like every minute of their kid, unless, unless they were well off. They didn't have, you know, video cameras to take pictures of their fucking kids and videos. And then all of a sudden the shit they keep adding more shots to it and there's just more and more and more and they just refuse to like accept it um aaron siri the uh lawyer for i can just won something about uh he well he uh deposed stanley plotkin the supposed vaccine bible writer guy right and got him to admit that they're uh selective in their clinical studies and that there's no follow-up studies hmm. got him to admit that you know under oath on in a deposition no less yeah wow that's impressive yeah i mean i you, you can say all you want about that organization but he's the one working with dell big tree right yeah i okay. mean people have like sketchy things to say about dell i've heard but I mean, anytime I watch the high wire, which isn't too often anymore, because I you know I'm tired of all the fucking problems in the world, to be honest. But uh, you know, their shit's legit for the most part. I mean, they, they get a little out there on the fucking high wire once in a while, but it's usually they bring in people with counterpoint of views to the narrative who have science to back them up. Yeah, um, I've, I haven't had a chance to talk to Dell myself, but I know a number of people who have, and and I have not heard anyone say a bad thing about him. At least as far as the people who've spoken with him personally. Yeah, I th he's he, he's you know I th I think that especially a lot of us who aren't polished are inherently wary of people who are super polished. Mm -hmm. And he kind of does have that like veneer of, you know, mainstream media on him. And that makes people skeptical. There's a number of things that Dell Big Tree will never talk about, but the stuff that he does talk about is usually accurate and beneficial information. And so <clears throat> I think we're a lot of the. Dell Big Tree is this or that or the other is just because the there's too many people that want one particular you know show host or personality or whatever to know everything and people get really mad if you don't cover the one thing that they think is super important right and like that's the only thing that matters to them and so why aren't you doing what matters to them? when that's not how people do their shows.
like at all. Yeah. But it's, yeah. I mean, I run into that a lot. <laughs> I would imagine. And, yeah. Because yeah, you have you a know. sizable audience. So I, I would imagine that, that you have a fair amount of people that reach out to you with, you know, whatever their thoughts on the, on the show are. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, people have never been shy about that bit, <clears throat> especially if they're angry with me. Uh, that's, that's usually when they're most vocal. If people are actually enjoying the show, then that's reflective in viewership. Sometimes it's reflective in, you know, contributions or something like that. But very rarely to people who are like really digging what we're doing, they don't reach out as much. It's the people who have a problem right. that, that reach out. And I try to take all of that into consideration. There's some shit that I don't fucking know. And I don't know if it's important to them. Okay, fine. But I don't know if it's real. And I certainly don't know if the angle of attack that, you know, I'm being told to take is legitimate. And I don't have fucking time. I don't. Dude, I'm, you know, putting content out seven days a week. Uh, and half of it's volunteer. You know, half of it's not even through uh, a mechanism that, you know, we have for the show to fund it. it. You know, certainly not on the new debate show that I'm doing with Balderson. You know, there's that's just on their YouTube channel. I'm putting it out on the Slow News Day Rockfin, too. But I've also told people to stop tipping through Rockfin, which they have took to mean stop tipping, which is unfortunate. Right. But because they only uh, ever hear the first two words. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, actually, Rockfin seems to be a failing platform. It's you said it, it, it has a few couple it's of years. Less failing than it is committing suicide. Yeah, that that's, that's accurate. Uh, I mean, they had at least fifty thousand plus viewers, give or take, um, overall with all their stuff, and just. Never did anything to promote it. Never did anything to upgrade their application. Their application sucks. Yeah. On like phones, which most people are listening to the stuff while they're doing shit, it crashes constantly. And I mean, I, I thought like the startup where you left off was like a great thing, but it never starts up where you left off. You're just like 20 minutes or 30 minutes behind where you started off. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and the chat is freaking cooked, and it always has been. Uh, you used to be able to reply to people, and they took that away, and now I think maybe you can, but um, they never integrated with StreamYard. And we were talking to, you know, trying to get them to do that for years, and they just, I don't know if they're incapable or inept or whatever, but the original team there, I, I don't know if any of them are still there. And I think the the new team that came in looked at, I, I think they probably saw some significant money laundering going on. And so now the recent problems that we've had are them trying to scramble to figure out how to unfuck the situation. I don't know if it's going to be around much longer. I really don't. It doesn't seem like it because from everything that I'm hearing from other people and, and me personally, I haven't been on Rockfin in months. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. I just lied. I was on Rockfin earlier today because I was pulling a link uh, for uh, your channel on Rockfin. Um, but everything that I've been hearing from people is not good. It It's all indications of a, a business that is failing rapidly. And it shouldn't be. It, it really shouldn't be. It, you know, it, when it was the early part of lockdown, um, even that first year, like the Ray token was anywhere from 2 to $4 uh, in value. Uh, <clears throat> there were lots of new people coming to the platform. And, and uh, then... Rumble got that infusion of Peter Thiel money and Donald Trump Jr. money and Vivek Ramaswamy money 
and Rumble really just sort of took over as, you know, alternative platform. Mm. And Rockfin didn't do shit. I, I don't know. I can't see how they didn't have money for an ad budget. The, the way that it was being generated, the only it, the only reasonable conclusion I can come to is that the management team was playing fast and loose and pocketing a lot of money that should have been put back into the company. Uh, and I can't I don't I just I don't see another way of that happening because all of the dev problems remain or are getting worse. And the app functionality is tanked, you know, and it's like, well, okay, the maybe the lights are on, but there's nobody in there running the store. Well, you got to have your Coke, your Pepsi, and then your RC Cola. And, yeah. Uh, and a Moon Pie. <laughs> Seems to be that way. Anytime, anything like that, that was what got me on Rockfin. Like a lot of the people I watched all of a sudden were getting um, censored off of YouTube and all the other platforms. And I started uh, following people to Rockfin. So I found AM Wake Up and uh, a bunch of other ones. Nico House, he's entertaining. <laughs> um, oh, Nico is endlessly entertaining. That's for Garland's, sure. Garland's, Garland's great. Garland's people a trip, tweet. man. Yeah, people who tell it like they feel. They're not, uh, I mean, even if I don't agree with their opinion, they're given how they feel based off of like real shit, not based off of propaganda. So I I respect their opinion, even if I don't agree. Well, yeah, yeah, Garland. I don't, I don't know if like any of and i've said this before and i'll probably continue to say it until i'm kicked off the internet <laughs> i don't think any of the metrics that we are shown are in any way accurate at all i really yeah. don't and i don't yeah. think that most people are buying the propaganda because again i interact with people here in Jasper on a weekly basis. All right. I get out of the house at least once a week. I'll say that much. Um, and you know, I'll have banter like with folks at the grocery store or folks, you know, over at the, at the Lowe's or whatever. And most of the people that I talk to seem to get it, you know, like they're, they're not like spouting a bunch of fucking MSNBC talking points or Fox News talking points or, you know, any of that bullshit. They're like, yeah, man, things are rough. And they're screwing yeah. us over. And we I know it. So. <laughs> I can talk to one of my brothers if I want MSNBC talking points. but uh... Yeah, but what I'm saying is like people understand that they're being put into a bad situation and it seems like they understand who is putting them in that position. It's, but again, there's still, there's a disconnect where n nobody seems to know what to do about it. Well, I, th I think a lot of people just want to keep doing the appeal to authority and uh, hoping that the people that they, selected at least they think they selected have their best interests at heart um because generally most good people want to uh, expect the best out of other people um unfortunately i grew up in a situation where i expect the worst out of people and hope for the best <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's the same with me oh shit! did we lose your audio again steve God damn it. Uh, is it back? Yeah. You're back. Okay. Yeah. No, every like little shift that, that I'm, I'm maybe I'll try plugging this into a different USB port tomorrow. Yeah, it sounds like you might have a short. But well, that's happening. That's happening. No, it's a uh, dude. This microphone's five and a half years old. Hmm. It's lasted though, man. It really has. 
I gotta I gotta give it up to what Mayono, the company that made this, seventy five bucks. USB mic plugs directly in. Yeah, it would probably be better if I had the arm, but again, that's <clears throat> back in Sonora. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's interesting because the disconnect happens at so many different levels and people will default to authority regardless of yeah. that authority's track record. And I mean, we saw the, the, I guess the propaganda in full effect, but I mean, even uh, on as inorganic a platform, it was like Twitter or meta or whatever, the amount of people who just flipped on a dime on Kamala Harris, where she was, you know, universally unliked and nobody really could tell you anything that she had ever done except for blow Willie Brown. And now she's like the best and smartest and she's joy and she's brat and she's this, that, and whatever else. It, like, I don't know anyone who honestly believes that, but I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure there are people out there that are like, Oh no. Yeah. She's great. She's great. Well, why? Well, because she's not Trump. But she's and that's a black all that woman. Yeah, sort of, I guess. I need to call my brother this weekend and see how he feels. There you go. You I, can I report two, back to us next week. I, I have two I have two brothers, one who believed in Trump for a while, so I kept telling them reasons <laughs> that he shouldn't believe that uh, people who bring pro wrestler uh, uh, Hulk Hogan into your convention – in character addressing the fucking crowd to a standing ovation like are you really taking this shit seriously dude right <laughs> he may not be the most serious candidate for the job no nah, he he's he 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 used to he he was like a carpenter for many many years and he used to listen to rush limbaugh while he would be working and uh i did some like windows and doors with him while Rush was still alive and had to be subjected to that shit. And I would just like talk shit on him all the time. Like, really, dude, this guy is a fucking clown. I, I don't know how you uh, can sit here and listen to these partisan hacks. And I was my, dad was, uh, my dad was a big Rush fan. I heard that yeah. in the car all the fucking time growing up. He was entertaining, but it was just hacky. Uh, bombastic and uh hyperbolic he was he was alex jones light really yeah 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 i'd agree with that for the main the mainstream crowd yeah i had to uh suffer through mark levin uh, oh. <laughs> when mom was still alive she listened oh. to it religiously that guy's terrible yeah he's really bad really bad and uh, and he loves Israel very much. Loves Israel, loves Trump. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love genocidal maniacs like <laughs> Southern leader before the UN saying that He's anybody still... anybody who disagrees with us is anti-Semitic and a bunch of filthy dogs or some shit? What, what did he say? <laughs> oh yeah, <clears throat> his show was on afternoons when I was in Vegas <clears throat> and uh, if you know I, I had forgotten to bring the Bluetooth speaker out with me or something like that driving up to Shug's house to do blunt force that's what would be on the radio and I mean it is the most surface level just hacky emotive performative nonsense i don't know how the dude has an audience i really don't like you could go quite literally listen to anybody else on the radio and get more informed or have a better understanding of any particular particular issue like is his audience mostly women is it i think his audience is mostly like his peer group as far as age is considered Cause I don't, I don't know anybody like our age or younger that would be able to tolerate listening to it. Like it's, it's so boomer centric. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's 
literally where his audience is. Now, it doesn't hurt that he's syndicated across like the entire Clear Channel network. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what Clear Channel station you turn into, you're going to hear him between, you know, 6 and 8 o'clock at night or whatever. You know, that doesn't hurt him at all. Isn't George Soros buying up like 200 radio stations or something, the dying media? Yes, but it's not for what everybody is saying it's for. He's going to fucking dismantle it and sell off the parts and probably end up making about a billion and a half on the deal. I don't know. That's what he does. Sounds like, yeah, usually. Sounds like somebody's going to get caught holding the bag. Nobody wants fucking that kind of media anymore. Nobody's listening to the fucking radio. I I haven't listened to the radio in a car. Um, Shit, I think we lost you again, Steve. Well, now. now, now we can hear you. Good lord, man! It's Ooh. it's typical for Liberty Radio, man. Like the NSA hasn't fucked with us all week. Now they're fucking with us. So yeah. I was, uh, I saw in the Telegram group, uh, Amber King from Roar Media was having issues trying to set up a show on Rockfin, and I haven't necessarily experienced that. There was a couple of weeks ago, it was taking up to ten or eleven minutes before, uh, yeah, it hmm. the go live button would turn red something like that but the setup i haven't had issues with i haven't seen like bars of death or anything show up in stream labs uh that's good and i've had you know i've had bandwidth problems in zoom the last couple of times that i went on for union of the unwanted which is now like the only show that is still operating on zoom really yeah. Huh. <clears throat> so Rich isn't using it for Grand Theft World anymore. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I've never done that show. Oh. Yeah. I haven't been on the uh, the broadcast on Zoom in a long time. Hmm. I don't know if it's even still there. Well, I'm sure it is. I mean, if they're still using Zoom, because that's the one of the things that I do know about Richard is he's a creature of habit. In that respect, he likes to have that shit be automatic so he doesn't have to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I like the various different layouts that you get with StreamYard. I, gen, you know, like that <clears throat> you can plug in a whole bunch of different channels to it. Uh, it's expensive, but pretty much all of these platforms are around the same. I did hear that StreamYard's about to jack up their prices, so I may have to seek out some alternative. Hmm. Um, That'd be a pain, uh, and I hope I don't have to do that. But if they're going to start charging 100 bucks a month or some ridiculous shit, I I can't do that. The 50 bucks a month hurts. Damn. Damn. That is, yeah. I can see that. Shit. And we might. Yeah, have to, uh, I mean, it's like six hundred, six hundred dollars a year to run the show. That's ridiculous. When they uh, double your fucking price, like ten dollars a month, maybe, but double. Well, that was the whole reason why I went with uh, Streamlabs in the first place. Is I got uh, a notice from Zoom. I don't know, back in like March or something, they're like, yeah, we decided we need to start charging more. Uh, So beginning on whatever arbitrary date they picked, it's going to be like this much more uh, whenever your subscription renews. And it was it was ridiculous. It was like an extra hundred dollars or some shit. They're not even providing anything new. No new features, no new functionality, none of that shit. No, we just we're not charging enough. So I was like, oh, okay, well. Streamlabs is much less, gives me greater functionality, so y'all can just fuck off now. Yeah, I remember when Streamlabs first, well, it was in beta, uh, and we tried using it briefly for the Assange vigils, 
and it was just it, it was pretty garbage but I've, over the years i've seen it develop it into what it is right now and it seems to be a, a pretty a pretty decent service all around yeah like i like i say except for the the one issue that i have for being able to share audio with you guys uh -huh. like it's great because it does it does literally all of the things it does the restreaming it you know it handles everything i like the uh um, the text to speech uh tip feature that they have oh, That's i don't pretty even cool. know about that i haven't explored that far into it so you can have people donate and you can set the the tip threshold wherever you want to but it'll just automatically pop up on screen with you know whatever the username is how much they donated and then robot voice or whatever reads off their uh their tip <clears throat> that's cool like i i wish uh i wish that's what happened if you you know when people donated on like rockfin or uh rumble yeah. Like if you're going through the website, I wish that it would populate like that. As it is, it's kind of difficult to keep up with, especially because I'm only looking at comments from inside of StreamYard. I'm not bouncing around to five different channels, you know, and trying to stay active in the chat because then I can't pay attention to my show. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that's that's kind of nice about Streamlabs too is they do have it's limited chat integration. I think it's only like five platforms where you can actually pull the chat into your control panel. Um, but I'm not I'm not able to broadcast on any of those platforms, so I don't actually get to use that functionality because <laughs> we're talking about like YouTube and Facebook and. Like all no. the places where like I'd be out after three broadcasts. Yeah. And, and probably one if we're being honest. I mean, you guys need to learn how to do those cat videos where you can like go on to YouTube, get some advertising money, cats doing tricks, running away from vacations and some, you know, Midwestern city. That would be fun. I don't know. I think there hasn't been enough of that taking advantage of the systems because um, all the people that do podcasts are generally creative people and just using something that's not going to be uh, pecked on. I mean, so that's kind of, I mean, <clears throat> to a degree that that's what the new debate show that I'm on is, you know, although I'm sure there's topics that we're going to cover that we're not going to be able to put that episode up on YouTube. But the problem is, is that YouTube already knows who you are. They've already got your IP address. And if you're on the no fly list for them, you know, it's you're going to get reach limited or de-boosted in the algorithm. They're just never going to let anybody see your channel. And uh, I, I have I've been on YouTube's, you know, undesirables list for fuck six years now. And for the, even when I go on somebody else's show, like it, as, especially if they still have a YouTube channel, they always have technical difficulties. <laughs> There's always some kind of, you know, uh, uh, tech glitch or whatever that, that occurs. Um, a camera will drop out, a mic will drop out, whatever. And it's the show is significantly suppressed in terms of view count and uh, availability and algorithm. And so I think specific IP addresses just, you know, trigger some sort of um, suppression algorithm. I mean, seeing uh, seeing Whitney Webb and uh, Derek Rose on Clayton's uh, redacted show is uh, something I didn't expect to say. I mean, I've seen Whitney on there a few times. And uh, the, the fact that, I, I mean, I know he's still playing to his like fake 
right wing audience uh, and profiting from it. But I I'm surprised that that's even getting platformed. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm stoked whenever, whenever like somebody whose work I appreciate gets to go out and do that on a, a you know larger or lower belt class platform. I just I think the redacted people are they're fucking thieves. Well, yeah, they're criminals. Yeah, yeah. Like so. I, they defrauded a whole bunch of regular working people on a real estate scam. Yeah, and then fled the country and lost a bunch of lawsuits. I guess they're back in the country now. I don't know. I I never actually sat there and watched their show. I can't. I see clips every now and then um and uh i i don't know like <clears throat> it's one thing to get an invite to a show and go on and talk your shit and, and leave i don't i don't I, I think everybody should have the availability to do that on as many different platforms as possible but i can't sit there and like support the actual show or anything and i'm I'm not going to give them a view, even if they're having one of my friends on. I'm just not. There's absolutely zero questions. Clayton Morris could ask Whitney Webb that she didn't address five years ago on Slow News Day. Oh, yeah. He definitely acts like it's new. <laughs> Everything is just like this just uncovered. It's like it's bombastic. Well, yeah, that's that's all part of the shtick. I mean, it came from Fox News. Well, yeah. I mean, it, they're again, just like Steve said, they're doing the exact same thing. It's the exact same model as it's always been. The only thing they did was put a shiny new wrapper on it. They changed yeah. the name, gave you a different graphic, told you it was brand new. But guess what? It was still just the same old fucking Coke. Well, and so many people from Fox have, you know, done the little crossover into podcasting or just stuff like that. Um, and it's been, I mean, the, it's the exact same model. They're still yeah. doing Fox news. They're just doing Fox news from where the allowable parameters of conversation have been shifted to over the last 10 years. You know, a lot of that is down to, uh, you know, Joe Rogan and shows like that where they were really were introduced to be new narrative management. And yeah, the, the parameters for what you're allowed to talk about <clears throat> have shifted, but there's still barriers there. None of those shows are ever going to step outside of that. You know, I'm glad Derek got to go on and talk about the fluoride trial. Um, but even then that's like a, a one and done or a two and done. And those guys aren't going to keep up on that content. They're not going to have people from fluoride action network come through there. No, none of that stuff. It's just what they're culture vultures and whatever's kind of popping in the zeitgeist. They're going to jump on that for clicks and they're going to jump on that for, you know, the ability to uh, raise revenue off of it. But I, you can tell just from jump that they're not about that life. They're not actually looking for solutions. They're looking to make money off of the people that might offer some, but they have no interest in actually, you know, creating that kind of community or creating that kind of culture. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that couple. Natalia and uh, Clayton as uh, her being some kind of dominatrix and him being the cock sitting in the fucking corner, but maybe this is my uh, warped sense of humor. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. You know, <laughs> I, I can see it. Just, just you know, based off of their uh, their appearance, yeah. Their Goth <laughs> yeah. I mean, he might even he might even like a good pegging every now and then. You never know. Well, mm -hmm. I, I I know people who were watching Sagger and Crystal when they were on the hill, and that kind of like woke them up during the whole COVID thing, and made them, you know, look at other sources. It was uh, a nephew of mine. And well, thank goodness him, for that. <laughs> him and his him and his wife had a baby, and having 
are not planning on getting any vaccinations. So uh, I, I think I told yeah. you this story before. It felt felt like a victory because like I yeah. we we talked at a family party and I uh, gave him a bunch of other resources to take a look at and he went did his own research so to speak. I mean, the one thing that we do have going for us is, is the the you know shiny happy people uh, on the screen there are really bad at their jobs, mm. and they're pretty one dimensional. And once once you know uh, somebody viewing that sees the the crack or sees the you know the narrative management, then there are a whole bunch of other options for them to go to. And that's why, you know, uh, I will always continue to support what Ryan does uh, on The Last American Vagabond because he catches a lot of those people as they're pulling away from the Clayton Morrises and the Crystal Balls and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's at least, like, big enough or, you know, recognizable enough to where uh, that can then, T-Lab can then become more of a, a freaking yeah the hub for better media and so i but oh god dude i remember watching uh and this is a, I, I got in a fight with graham elwood about this online uh back in 2019 because everybody was sucking up the crystal ball because she was shiny whatever and we had found a video where her and sagger were like brutally mocking the forced uh, arbitrary detention that Assange was going through in the embassy and just being fucking vile with it, you know? And I'm like, Graham, dude, this is your girl. This is, this is your girl right here. Like what's up buddy. And he freaked out on me. Uh, and then several months later started telling his audience that uh, I was a fed and they should dox me and they should not go to our events. Yeah. 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 God, what a douche. Him good and uh, Jimmy yeah. Dore were him and Jimmy Dore were good friends, weren't they? For a while. Oh yeah. <laughs> Till COVID. Who who hasn't Jimmy Dore been friends with? I don't know. He I, I don't know, man. I don't know how to take that guy. I mean, he doesn't, you know, like Steve said, everybody doesn't see everything and they don't address everything, but he's been pretty fucking on point for the last couple of years on a lot of shit. And he's got a big audience, so it, it doesn't uh, doesn't hurt to get some of that shit out there. Like my 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 thing with the people like Alex Jones is like he told you a lot of true shit, but he was so like over the top crazy um, in his delivery of it that he was easy to discount. And then when he would do shit that was clearly fucking bullshit, it would just take all the good shit that he said and you know. Oh, you should watch this Alex Jones video. Oh, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. I mean, that fucking psyop, if I've ever saw one. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the nature of limited hangouts is 80 or 90% truth, 10 to 20% total discrediting of everything else that they just said. <clears throat> and, you know, Alex Jones's particular style of de delivery got him a huge audience mm -hmm. of midwits <laughs> just <laughs> fucking midwits yep yeah and i that's what those kinds of things are designed to do and whether it's you know jones or but jimmy or any of those people they're always the only people that are talking about it there's always nobody else in the face of the world that's you know brave enough to tackle these issues meanwhile you know there's an entire media ecosystem <clears throat> that has been covering this stuff for years like as it happened in real time and in order to keep the business going uh those guys just have to pretend like that ecosystem doesn't exist right and then every once in a while like whitney will be on Ryan will be on, or Corbett will get an invite, or something like that. And their audiences don't know how to handle that. It's so far out of their scope of knowledge base and understanding that most of them have a negative reaction mm -hmm. when somebody like that comes on the show. 
Well, Corbett was the first one I ever came across and very late in the game. Like I already knew shit was fucked and knew the whole political system wasn't, was pro wrestling. That's why I used to tell everybody <laughs> from like 2000 on, it's just fucking pro wrestling. And then I came across Corbett in probably like 2014 off of some random, somebody posted, you sound like James Corbett. And it was something about being nonpartisan. And I was like, oh, I got to check out this guy. And I searched for him and like, he wasn't the first search result. He was like way down in the search results, his actual website. And mm -hmm. I watched some of his videos and it was like, wait a minute. He has like sources listed for everything he's talking about in this video. Like where the fuck has this been? Like my whole adult life. And from him, I found like everybody else I've ever listened to pretty much. It's so, amazing like, how many people Corbett was a gateway drug for. It really yeah. is. Like I can't I can't even think of how many people I've talked to who said like Corbett was was the one that kind of brought them out of their stupor. It's incredible. Yeah. It, it, well, I mean, he his work is pretty unimpeachable. Well, yeah. You know, and really I mean, he he legitimizes but much more so than just about anybody I could think of what what it is that we're doing or what we're trying to do um and yeah dude just an absolute encyclopedia and i think that's why ryan has gotten the heat that he has because he took that same model of posting all your sources and uh, objectively talking about stuff and pointing out the hypocrisy and the the, the fake shit and everything and that that kind of like truth so to speak is hard to rebut from any any level other than blatant like fucking lawsuits and censorship and deplatforming in every fucking way it's like people can get on and talk shit and you know talk their opinions and that's probably gonna you know if the, depending on your following that's going to get you censored to a degree but when you're documenting your sources on everything you're talking about that's uh that's going to get you a lot more scrutiny i would think oh yeah well especially from all the wrong people too right because that's that's not how you're supposed to be doing it if you want to be rewarded well, that's how you're supposed to do it if you want to be punished because that's what they do they punish you for for citing your sources and uh not being editorial in your presentation and you know all that fun stuff Telling people i'm not trying to tell you what to believe watch this see the sources um use your critical thinking skills and come to your own conclusion is dangerous as fuck to the ruling class well and i mean even something as simple as exposing people to you know other sources of information in general like just not sticking with whatever garbage mainstream outlet or you know establishment book something like that uh know for a fact that like Tease is just hammered with censorship not only because he lives in canada but because the kind of his body of work uh is pretty fucking unimpeachable too and it that's it, amazingly dangerous you know because tease is doing that with puppets and sources you know and he's actually figured out how to emotionally calibrate content to people who need to hear it who would you know come across like this show or am wake up or something like that and be horrified by what we're saying not just what we're saying, but that we're having fun while we're saying it. We're laughing about it. We're making jokes about it. Like, I, I really, it took me a long time to understand just how offensive that is to normies. Yeah, they don't like I, it at all. You know, I didn't get all. it. Like, I just thought we were having fun, you know. It's like, no, huh? The, it's it's well, truly. We're not taking it serious enough, Steve. That's That's the problem. Because they take it way more seriously than, than they think that we do because we're making jokes about it. They don't understand that we make the jokes about it to keep from going insane. Yeah. 
definitely a coping mechanism. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, I've, I've told people for years, man, that if it wasn't jokes, the show would just be me screaming and slamming my head into the wall. And I'm not going to do that for three hours. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> I mean, it depends on on how how many super chats I get. Quite honestly, but <laughs> <laughs> right, the more you pay, the more bloody I'll make my face. We're GG Allen up in this so, shit. Yeah, I used to do it at the the fucking DC Armory every other weekend, and I was paying twenty bucks to get in. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, I did uh, a Halloween maze at the DC Armory one year it was 2002 and the company that i worked for also did like stage and lighting and stuff like that for various different concerts load in load out that kind of thing uh, but they did the halloween maze at the dc armory and that year uh, the theme had been selected the previous year and the theme because the tv show survivor was popular was no survivors but it happened wow. to be the Halloween after 9-11. So we had did. to change up a bunch of, you know, a bunch of stuff. Couldn't be no surprise. Originally, it called for like a, a plane crash sort of thing when you walked in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we ended up building like over a mile of maze inside that fucking thing. It was cool. It was, I had a lot of fun doing that gig. Paid great, too. It was yeah, twenty some years ago, and I was, uh, I wasn't the lead carpenter, but I was like journeyman carpenter, and I was still making thirty five an hour. Oh, nice. Plus overtime. Oh, it was fantastic. Oh yeah, it was killer money. That's honestly the only thing that I miss about being part of regular society. <laughs> was the income? That's it. Yeah. Everything else I can do without. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I mean, that's, you know, it, it wasn't like I was making, you know, fucking millions or anything like that. But in, you know, 2001, 2002, you go to work for 10 days, walk away with like 3,500 bucks, four grand, something like that. And you wouldn't need, I wouldn't need to work for another freaking two months if I wanted to. Right. Or ride out on that like a motherfucker. It's not what happened, but, you know, it definitely made it so. Because when you do Renaissance festivals, you don't work in the winter. They fo follow the weather. And so you start in, like, Arizona or Florida in February. But your season wraps in October, maybe November. Uh, and so you have a few months off. So the whole point of going to work was so that you could, you know, take a, a fun winter vacation or like winter somewhere cool as opposed to, you know, trying to grind it out somewhere for another like weekend show or something like that. There was the Charles Dickens Fair at the Cow Palace in uh, Daly City, San Francisco area. And that was a winter show, but that was hectic. Like you were dressing like 1800s Victorian. You had to have your costuming approved. It had to be your, uh, whatever you were doing had to be juried in. You got accent checked and stuff like that to make sure that you were, you know, staying in character and stuff like that. And I just, that, that wasn't me. Sounds like a lot of drugs were needed. Sounds like an alternate, like, dead tour kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, they actually, they considered uh, the deadheads and Rennies to be uh, organized homeless. <laughs> and that after the, after Jerry Garcia died, um, the largest population of organized homeless were people who traveled with the Renaissance Festival. Because you, yeah, I mean, you work 10 months out of the year, you just didn't have a permanent address. I remember the day he died, I was in Ocean City, New Jersey, and there were people out on the boardwalk that were crying for Jerry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I believe it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was, let's see, I think my job at the time was at Bass Pro Shop, and uh. 
there was like a outlet mall type scenario <clears throat> and my buddy phil came in crying he was one of those people crying over it and uh we i i walked out of work with him I'm like i'm gonna take a break we went and smoked a couple of joints in his car and then we went to cinnabon yeah and then i eventually went back to work and i got in some trouble for that <laughs> proper tribute to jerry <laughs> right yeah. weed and cinnabon well because we didn't have crack <laughs> he died of heroin didn't he um he died of heroin withdrawal. He was in a, a rehab center. Huh. I thought it was. And it's possible that somebody like hooked him up while he was there, uh, and that he did OD in the rehab center. But uh, that that was just a rumor. Never really got any confirmation of that. I don't know. Hmm. I think you guys know this. I was plugged into that whole scene for a number of years. Have my my gang tattoo. Hmm. Yeah, it's just got a uh, gets a hook on people quick. It's weird, man, being on the inside of a freaking thirty year long psyop. I bet. Definitely weird. Like, did you yeah. have any idea of the the intelligence links, like while you were a part of it, or was that Not something that you until... found out afterwards? Not until like right at the very end, and it's only because there were so many fucking feds around. And it what you know, it it was after uh Operation Dead End where they started rolling up everybody and they took out the fluff LSD family, uh, and a couple other like ma major chemists and stuff like that got popped, and then their whole network got broken up. And, um, like, I god, it was like 94, maybe nine, yeah, 94. Um, and we were in Colorado uh, having a conversation in a hotel about like how many people we knew that had been busted in the last six months. And it really fucking dawned on us that like the entire community was just one long running operation and that they were perfectly happy to use all of us to distribute uh, especially LSD. But then once, uh, once people, I don't know, started waking up to a certain degree the, then they had to rug pull it. Yeah. And, uh, I, ugh, just, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. It, it was uh, to this day. There's still a handful of people that I talked to from back in that era. And I, either everybody is, you know, completely checked out, uh, not a part of that scene anymore. Or, the people that we still knew from back then are like fedded up wow. dude, and plugged and like way plugged in, you know, they're all making freaking millions of dollars a year and shit like that. They all got property in Hawaii and stuff, but they're doing it at the behest of ultimately the FBI and the CIA. And they know that. And there's a lot of fucking occult shit and a lot of fucking human trafficking that goes on. Um, yeah, it's it's nuts. It's dirty, that's for sure. Wow. Yeah. Once I once I started to figure out how dirty it was, and like the very brief time that uh I was allegedly part of a nitrous distribution operation, I got to see just how depraved the fucking hippie crack makes people and <laughs> what they'll do for it. Okay. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm never going to be able to live with myself. I got to get out of this shit. It was, I mean, people handing you, trying to hand you their clothes, people trying to hand you their girl. <laughs> Just give us 10 balloons. She'll blow you right now. A little nitrous. No. Christ. I thought, you know, I, I wouldn't say a lot of nitrous balloons, but 
you know, every time you go to a concert or something like that, there's always somebody in the parking lot blowing up balloons until the fucking cops come and seize their tanks. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I can't there imagine. 30 more tanks right after that one gets taken. Yep. Dude, the yeah. Philly Nitrous mob is no fucking joke. Dude, and, and yeah. not, not anybody you want to mess with from what I've heard. Mm -mm. No, those are fucking gangsters. Yeah. I came yeah. out of a Phillies game and got two balloons. And like as the as I had like just got handed the balloons, the guy was getting shut down by the parking lot security. <laughs> and uh the security waited for him to hand me the balloons. <laughs> Like, okay. oh, that was very polite of them. It's like, I already paid my money, man. What are, you gonna right? do? what are we doing here? Maybe Those they were three just fans of Free dog. Enterprise. You never know. Well, damn, Steve. It's been three hours, man. Yeah. We're already rolling up on uh, midnight on the East Coast. Well, for the folks who, who actually have electricity on the East Coast this evening. Right. Uh, shout out to everyone in the Southeast. Hopefully everyone is uh, safe and sound, especially in the Liberty Radio, AM Wake Up families and uh, the extended families beyond. But uh, I'm going to let you off the hot seat, my man. Thank All you. right. Well, Thank everybody... you for being so generous with your time this evening. Yeah, no problem, man. Thank you for inviting me on. I had a blast. Everybody go listen to Hurricane Party by James McMurtry. Okay. Especially if you're in that area. Um, and then maybe a little, uh, maybe a little Stevie Ray Vaughan, get a little Texas flood going. There you go. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I appreciate it, man. I really do. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. We'll get you back on, uh, and we'll learn more, uh, about that, uh, PSYOP that you were a part of. I didn't even know that. And, but we don't have time to get into it right now. So I'll say, yeah, no, i for uh, next time. I gotta hear how many jobs Steve has has had in his life. Uh, uh, I was I was on the inside of some shit, man. That's for sure. Yeah, it was it, it, enlightening. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> well, we'll be back. But yeah, and if anybody doesn't know, please go to amwakeupshow.com. dot com. That's where you'll find everything else for all of the other shows and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, and yeah, yeah, I appreciate you, Dress. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Take care. All right, my friend. Take care, Rob. Good to see you. Take care, Steve. Peace. All right. We'll be back on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I guess we'll have open lines regular again next week. I don't know. We'll see. I'm out to some other folks. You never know who might drop in. <laughs>